Can you hear me? Good afternoon. If we could at this time, please have everyone take a seat and silence any electronic noise making devices you might have with you. My name is uh, Chairman Arrington. I'm the chairman of the Osceola County Commission. At this time, I'd like to uh, recognize my fellow board members, Commissioner Cheryl Grieve, uh, Commissioner Viviana Jayner, Commissioner Peggy Chowdhury, Commissioner Fred Hawkins, and I do believe we've also been joined by Ms. Olga, Commissioner Olga Gonzalez from the city of Kissimmee. I think that's all of our elected officials except for Mayor Dyer, which I'll be bringing up very shortly. Um, good morning and welcome to the second in a series of regional affordable housing workshops. I'm happy to see such an amazing turnout here this morning, and it's, it's nice to see so many people with the same concerns about affordable housing here in Central Florida. In adopting our strategic plan, Osceola County has made affordable housing a top priority. We recognize the tremendous needs in our region, and we are committed to finding solutions for all of our residents. We broke ground this year on Cameron Preserve, an innovative project providing affordable renting units to help transition families out of homelessness. The first phase includes 100 apartments for families at or below 80% of the county median income. And our goal is to help homeless families, including those living in motels or doubled up with family and friends, into permanent housing. But much more needs to be done to address this issue here in Central Florida. Our recent adopted sustainability plan takes a fresh look at the housing issues and offers comprehensive, holistic, market-based strategies for providing housing. We recognize that if we want to make meaningful strides toward providing enough housing here in our community, we have to work together with the housing delivery system in partnership with housing builders and developers. We must ensure that we're doing everything as a local government can do to maximize opportunities to provide the type of housing we need at a cost our residents can actually afford. And this morning you'll hear not only from Osceola County, but other counties and cities in our region, as well as private sector developers who will discuss their ideas, projects, and in innovations. And I hope we can all learn and create some ideas amongst ourselves and try to find ways to, to help our working class families here in our Central Florida region. We're, we're well aware of, of, of the, the jobs that are here in our community. And we're also well aware of what rents go for currently in, in Central Florida. And there's a big gap when it comes to those two things. So I want to thank you all once again for trying to work together to make sure everybody has an opportunity to have a permanent stable house or roof over their head. And at this time, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce a partner that we work with tandemly on all kinds of issues, whether it's housing or whether it's the Maria assistance for folks fleeing Puerto Rico coming to Central Florida. And so at this time, I welcome Mayor Jacobs to the mic. Well, thank you, Chairman Arrington. Thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you for your hospitality. I can't tell you how fun it is to be in somebody else's chambers. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's just really cool. Nobody gets to ask me any hard questions. I don't have to make any tough decisions. I could stay here all day, maybe all week. To set the stage, though, I think it's important to remember that the lack of affordable housing is not something unique to Central Florida or to even to the state of Florida. As you may know, the uh, National Low Income Housing Coalition announced two years ago that there was not a single state in the union where a minimum wage full-time worker could afford an apartment at the market rate. I mean, that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Now, having said that, our situation is definitely more extreme than many. We, like so many across the nation, have seen this problem grow exponentially since the recession. As more and more people have chosen to rent rather than own, as the credit markets have become tighter, the availability of affordable housing for so many of our working families, as Chairman Arrington pointed out, is becoming a significant problem for quality of life and for finding the people to, to um, take the jobs that we have here in Central Florida. So it's a humanitarian problem, it's also an economic problem, and it's all of our problems. We kicked off this initiative for a regional affordable housing effort through a summit in 2016. And the reason we're doing this regionally is because there's no other way you can effectively address affordable housing. It's so often the case across the nation where you see one city taking one approach, the county that that city is in is taking a different approach. The next county is taking a completely different approach. Imagine the chaos for the, the affordable housing 
um, developers who are trying to figure out where's the best place to go. These folks are giving me incentives. These folks are mandating my development. <coughs> All types of different approaches. And oftentimes those approaches are conflicting. At a minimum, they're confusing. And they don't result in what we need. And that's affordable housing that's not just affordable from the standpoint of the roof over your head, but also affordable from a living standpoint. It's not good enough to be out in Timbuktu and have an affordable apartment, but you can't get to work because you're so far out there's no transit. And your commute ride in and your tolls coming in run up the cost of living. So we have to look at the whole equation and we have to do it together. The cool thing about Central Florida, the cool thing about Osceola County, Seminole County, and Orange County is there is not another set of counties or local governments in the nation that do collaboration like we do collaboration. So if anybody can tackle this, what appears to be almost an impossible problem around the nation, it's us. And that's why I am so really proud to be a part of this community, to have my colleagues here in Osceola County hosting this. One thing you all should probably know about the working, working relationship that we have, I, I have never imagined before I ran for office, knowing what I thought of politicians, that I would find myself working amongst such incredibly dedicated, committed, in, um, elected officials, human beings that care passionately about what they do. And we, from time to time, we'll have our disagreements, but there isn't a commissioner here in Osceola County that I don't personally really, really like and enormously respect. And I can say the same for Seminole, I can say the same for my own commission. And I think that's pretty phenomenal, that we live in a community where our citizens have the good judgment to elect really good people to office. People that come into office and know that there's more to what they need to do than just making themselves look good. That the bottom line is, they need to make a good community for each and every one of our citizens that are here today, and equally important, the citizens that will live here tomorrow and for generations to come. One that will never have a chance to vote for us, but that's why we do what we do. So I wanted to thank um, my colleagues here in Osceola County and in Seminole County. I wanna thank each and every one of you because this is a collaborative effort. Government absolutely cannot do it alone. And I, I will say that about so many things, but there is nothing more true than when we talk about housing and affordable housing. It takes all of us. It takes economists. It takes the financial markets. It takes the development community. Those who are in affordable housing development and those who aren't to help us figure out how do we create the policies and the right environment to get the housing that we need for our citizens and make sure that everyone who lives here can, or works here, can afford to live here. So to everyone who is participating, whether you're in the audience or you're going to be on a panel today, thank you for being a part of the solution that's gonna make Central Florida a sustainable community for generations to come. God bless. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I have, I have one more official duty, and my only official duty, I think, while I'm here, and that is to introduce our manager of housing and community development and the moderator for this, um, this particular program, and where is he? Where Mitchell are, Glasser. Right there you are, Mitchell Glasser. <laughs> and if you don't know Mitchell, um, we, he, we hang on to him really, really tightly because every time he does a great project, somebody wants to steal him. Um, I thought we were gonna lose him to Miami-Dade County when we did a really phenomenal project in the Pine Hills area. So um, one of the things I love about Mitchell is he's always willing to think outside the box, try to think creatively, creativity, Great housing, great design at an affordable price. That's what we're about here today, and you're gonna hear some neat ideas, I think, for the type of product that can accommodate families for generations to come. Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor, and welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to see uh, such a diverse group of people here with us today. In coordination with our regional partners, um, Osceola, Seminole, Orange, and the city of Orlando, we have put together this workshop to begin the process of identifying housing products that could help us meet our affordable housing needs. Uh, with us here today is Owen Beitch from GAI Community Solutions. Owen, raise your hand. Tony Del Poso, Related Urban Development Group. Gary Gray with Tahugua Development Group. And our regional partners that are with us today, we have Donna King, Community Development Manager of Seminole County. We have Jason Burton, Chief Planner, City of Orlando. 
Susan Caswell, Assistant Community Development Director, and Alberto Vargas, Planning Manager for Orange County. Throughout the workshop, we will be accepting questions via Twitter. It won't be any from me because I haven't used Twitter yet. <laughs> uh, understanding the ha under the hashtag on the banner that you'll see pound CFL housing. You can tweet your questions anytime and they will be answered during our Q&A session. We will also have wireless microphones. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mitchell. Uh, since Mitchell hasn't used Twitter before, he would not know that that's not pound anymore. Okay. That's now <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mayor. She, she's definitely identifying my age. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Following the session, um, feel free, free to look at the displays around the room on housing products in the air, from area developers and builders and also um, check out our tiny home just outside the building uh, to the left, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I'm gonna begin with a, a presentation on just a little bit of background on how we ended up where we are today. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the state and regional perspective on housing, talk about the regional affordable housing initiative and these implementation workshops. This is the second <clears throat> of a series of <clears throat> three workshops that we're having. So for some background, um, everybody's aware that rents have been increasing throughout uh, apartments throughout the state. Uh, while incomes have remained relatively flat, even though we're starting to see some, some slow growth in, in household income. Home ownership rates have declined and there's a higher demand for affordable rentals. We also looked at demographics of our populations from the baby boomers to Generation X to millennials. And millennials are going to be the biggest um, generation um, you know, in history. And we want to study also what, what millennials are going to want in terms of their housing um, desires. 71% of the millennials <clears throat> want to live and work <clears throat> excuse me, in a walkable, mixed-use urban community. 50% are renters, 21% live at home, and, but they're open to creative living arrangements that make life affordable. Millennials want the complete package. And looking at the state, um, uh, affordable housing study that's conducted by the Schimberg Center at the University of Florida, we have some trends that we want to share with you. More Florida households, both lower and higher incomes, are renting. Between 2007 and 2014, the home ownership rate fell 71, from 71 percent to 65 percent. That's a huge drop. Over 70 percent of the renters under 50 percent AMI, which is very low income, are cost burdened paying more than 40% of their income on rent. Rents have increased sharply, but medium rental household is income is still at below the 2007 levels. In the Schimberg data, we also looked at home sales prices. And with the increase in medium home sales price, the supply of for sale homes <laughs> in certain price categories is continuing to decrease. The medium house price for our metropolitan area right now is at $218,000. When we look at the, uh, some of the market data for, on rental housing, we see that um, in incomes in range of 80%, which is considered low mod, to 120% of area medium, which is considered moderate, there has been an ample supply of rental housing that's been affordable to that group. When we start to go into the low income group, the very low income and extremely low income, we start to see where the deficits on affordability really begin to grow. And you can see the income uh, ranges on the right of the screen of the uh, households that we're talking about. So obviously wages play a big part in, in this, for, in this um, issue of affordability. 
as well as supply. Our Regional Affordable Housing Initiative really was started um, in a response to the shortage of housing supply to lower income households. Mayor Jacobs uh, asked us to um, begin to work with our regional partners approximately two years ago. And we began to look at um, a lot of issues regarding our, tri our tri counties area. One of the things we looked at is identifying areas for access and opportunity. We're exploring population growth and corresponding supply and demand of affordable housing types, defining place-based policy standards and incentives. Our regional implementation is taking a place-based approach, housing access and opportunity model, um, uh, analyzing where jobs, transit and services are located, um, good schools, and where would be the most opportunity areas for affordable housing to be included in the, in the development. When we look at our po regional population growth, and this is our three county area, you know, over the next 23 years, we see a population increase from 1.9 million to 3.4 million in 2040. When we, when we put this on a map, in a GIS map, and we start to see where those co population growths are gonna concentrate, you know, we can begin to, can begin to see a pattern uh, in our areas, and then we can um, plan for how to make sure that we have a variety of housing types to serve that population. Um, projected employment growth and during that same period, again, we can start to see where the concentration of employment growth will occur over time. Moving across county lines in terms of um, travel to work, uh, we looked at the, um, the, the three county area. And in, in Seminole County, 57% uh, of the working residents stay in the county and 43% leave. In Orange County, 90% stay and 10% leave. And in Osceola County, about 50-50 in terms of residents that stay and leave to go to work. We kicked off this initiative with a regional affordable housing summit that was held October 20th, 2016. We, get, we began to analyze the national housing crisis, uh, the regional issues, our economic outlook, our affordable housing supply. We, we invited guests from around the state um, to talk to us about some strategies and tools, some creative solutions that have been uh, used throughout the state. And, and begin to develop a framework for moving forward and having these workshops. The Regional Housing Summit helped us uh, take the first steps towards identifying and discussing affordable housing options, real alternatives to increase the production, and regulatory mechanisms. Our implementation workshops are basically a where, what, and how um, type of formula. Our workshop one, uh, which we held on May, ni May 19, 2017, was about the where. Uh, where is the, the, the most opportune place to have affordable housing be included in the development in those areas? So there act we looked at access and opportunity to affordable housing. We had a suitability analysis that was done uh, with our, our partner at uh, the Schinberg Center for Affordable Housing, and they used a model and adapted that model to our area and ran it for our three-county area, including the city of Orlando. And it's a model that we're going to be having. It's going to be given to each county, and it's something we can use over time as our data changes, and we can begin to see, you know, where those type of areas are. Our workshop two, which is where we're here today for, is going to be talking about housing products and design. And our third workshop will be sometime in early 2018, and that's gonna be where the rubber meets the road, talking about regulatory and financial strategies for increasing affordable housing. So that concludes my presentation, and I am now gonna be welcoming Susan Caswell to the podium. Susan is the Assistant Community Development Administrator for Osceola County, where she oversees <clears throat> several departments including planning, parks, natural resources, sports and event facilities. 
Prior to coming to Osceola County in 2014, Ms. Caswell worked for Orange County for eight years as the planning manager and assistant to the director to community environmental and development services. Susan? Thank you. <coughs> okay. While I wait for them to pull up my presentation, good morning, everyone. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, my job today is to kind of set the stage and talk about uh, housing product and why housing product is important. Um, and to do that, um, I'm going to delve into a little bit of history, uh, talk about why housing type matters, um, and then talk about what Osceola County has done to better understand the needs here and the supply and where the gaps are. Um, talk about how we've looked at local government's role and what we can do to get the right products into the right places. Um, so, a little bit of history. I know I only have 20 minutes, but um, I, I did want to go back. And the reason I want to go back some is that when we think about this issue, it's important to understand the entire context of it because we need to understand why we are where we are and whether we want to continue down a certain path or whether we need to rethink some things. And so I put some basic information in here just so we could understand. You know, we understand the housing market as it is now. But 30-year mortgages are actually a fairly recent thing. They're not even 100 years old. And before that, buying a house was a little bit like um, renting furniture by the week. Um, it was very unstable. It was difficult to buy a house, and you could lose it at any time. 30-year mortgages greatly stabilized that market. And then, of course, we had World War II, the GIs coming back, the baby boom. We've all heard this. And we had other products that made getting mortgages easier, FHA and the GI Bill. And we had a need for 6 million houses before the end of the decade. And so um, home builders stepped up. They started building. And the baby boom and the suburban boom are kind of happening at the same time. Uh, Levittown being a good example, I think he was trying to provide most of the 6 million himself. But the home building industry and us as homeowners changed rapidly. So in the next 20 years, from 1940 to 1960, we basically went from 43.6 to 61.9 percent home ownership. We became a majority home owning nation. It was very, very successful. Uh, but a lot's changed since then. And some of it you've heard already from Mitchell. Uh, what's happened with housing and what's happened with households has made a big difference. So number one, homes are larger. In 1950, the average was 983 square feet. Today, the average new home is 2,600 square feet. And that's a big difference. And that has happened even while household size has shrunk. So 1950, 3.37 people. Now we're down to just over 2.5 people per household. So households are getting smaller. Housing size is getting larger and therefore more expensive. Um, we need more cars. When the suburban boom came, a development pattern that's very auto-oriented. And what you see here is um, in those decades from 60 to 2000, the percentage who didn't own cars went from over 20 to under 10. You can see in the middle the one car and two car. One car has decreased, two cars have increased, and three car families have tripled in that time. Cars are not cheap, and that has a bearing on affordability. Um, for some people, income is stagnant, and Mitchell talked about that as well. Um, very high wage people had a, a very good increase. Middle wage, just a little bit. Low wage people actually lost ground. So when you add all of this together, um, an industry that was meeting the needs of the majority of our population and doing it very well in that 20 year period, an 18% increase in home ownership. Now, in the next 55-year period, it's only increased by 1.5%. It's not a failure of the housing industry by any means, but what I think and what I think we should consider is that we are reaching equilibrium with home ownership. And so we've created this American dream of owning your own home, owning your own property, but it's not necessarily an appropriate dream for everyone at every stage in their life. And I think the, f the fact that we're not increasing anymore means we need to think about what kind of types of housing are appropriate for the people in our communities. 
So who are we and what do we need? And for Osceola County, um, we've gone and looked at this to try to determine a little bit more about who's here and what kind of housing needs we have. And so you heard Mayor Jacobs mention um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition and their study, and we start to see these more and more that our lack of affordable rental housing is some of the worst in the nation. What that is referring to is the study that talks about how much you have to earn to be able to afford an apartment. And for uh, Florida, in case you can't read it, it's $20.68 an hour. And that's to afford a two-bedroom apartment without being cost burdened, without spending more than 30% of your income. If you spend more than 30%, you're considered cost burdened. And if we just look at the numbers, for Osceola County, 41,000 households, about 44% of our households are cost burdened. But this is an incomplete picture, and we really want to get a better handle on this, and we want to look beyond numbers. So to do that, we're going to look at some more numbers. Um, so, but to give us an idea of who we're talking about here, um, what you're looking at, uh, the bars represent the entire population in that income group, so you have less than 20,000 all the way down to 50,000 and more. The colors represent how much they're paying for housing. So if it's gray, they're paying less than 30%, they're good. Um, if it's blue, they're paying between 30 and 50%, and if it's green, they're paying more than half their income for housing. So this gives us a pretty clear picture of what we're looking at. At less than $20,000, 90% of them are cost burdened, most of those at the 50% level. Clearly we have an issue there. At the twenty dollars to $35,000 level, we still have three quarters of our households cost burdened, a lot fewer of them at the 50% level, which is encouraging. I'm gonna skip over 35 to 50 for a minute, just so I can tell you that we're not terribly worried about those 50,000 or more. Uh, most of them are doing fine. Uh, we actually do have, I think, about 28 households earning more than 100000 a year who are spending more than half their income on housing, but we don't think that's a housing supply problem. So if you're earning 50000 or more in this county, the market is meeting your needs. So let me jump back to the 35 to 50. We still have more than half of them cost burden, but this group is different. Number one, you've got a lot fewer of them at the 50% level. I will tell you in that blue area, about a third of those are only paying about 35% of their income. So it's not a huge overage. And the 30% is a, a rule of thumb, so we need to think about that. The other thing that's significant about this group is for the first time in this um, continuum, owners outnumber renters. In fact, eight out of 10 of the ones in the 50% are owners. And because we all know they're not gonna sell you a house at 50% of your income, something happened to those folks after they got in that house, that's once again probably not a housing supply problem. So at that level, for the most part, their needs are getting met, especially at the higher end of that level. So what this tells us is we really need to focus on this group here, the, the up below $35,000, which in, for Osceola County, 35 is about 80% of median. I know Mitchell mentioned median, so that's how it relates. So this takes us from 41,000 households down to 27,000, still a lot. Uh, and there's, but there's two things I want you to remember about this. Number one, almost a third of those folks are elderly. So we talk a lot about wages, but for those people, this is not a wage issue. Um, the other thing I want you to remember about this is these data do not include the people living in the motels, and we have a lot of them. I think we can assume their incomes are low, we know they need affordable housing, so we keep them in mind as we're doing this. But narrowing it down to this group allows us to delve deeper into who these people are. And so um, I've put some, num um, some information up here. We know the tourist sector workers, the wages are low, we have a lot of folks living in those motels out there, we know that's an issue. Elderly households, as I mentioned, half of, um, half of them have incomes under 35,000. And then younger households at the other end of the spectrum, 60% under 35,000. One person households, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, their median income is 60% of the county median. Um, and then one worker household, 40% of our households below poverty have only one worker. The people living in motels, we can make assumptions that those folks have um, lower incomes, although I will say that some of them could afford apartments. There are any number of reasons why they're not in apartments. And then single parent households, 67% of them earn less than $35,000 a year and they are raising a family. Now there's a lot of overlap here. Um, we know we have tourist sector workers living in the motels. 
We know a lot of elderly households are one-person households, and elderly households are a very interesting demographic because we have a lot of them in the lower income levels. We have a lot of them that are single-person households, and they are 75 to 80 percent homeowners. So clearly there are circumstances that have changed since those folks bought their houses, and they are now in houses that are much bigger than they need and more expensive than they can afford. Uh, younger households, a lot of one-worker households that are younger. Um, and then as far as the single-parent households, one-worker, single-parent household, and we know there a lot of them are living in motels. In fact, every time I see an article about the, the motels and they interview someone, it's a one-worker household. So narrowing this down kind of to get an idea of who these people are helps us to understand what they need because 27,000 households is a lot of households. But we don't necessarily need 27,000 units. A lot of them are in units. Maybe they need roommates. Maybe they need smaller units. Maybe they need a different kind of unit. Maybe because if you look at this group, a lot of these folks are in a certain stage of their life. If they're a young household, they need more income. They need perhaps training. And we're doing a lot of things on a lot of fronts to help these people with their needs. Um, relative to the household size, and, and, and the reason this is important is it goes back to our housing supply. Half of our households, over half, have one or two persons in them. But when you look at the house size, you look at efficiency and one bedroom units in the county, it's 8% of our inventory. So the housing we're building, is mostly three bedroom, it's bigger than what we need, and the reason that matters is, as I mentioned, the median income for a one person household is much lower than the overall median, it's about 60%. The median rent um, is $150 lower a month for a one bedroom. So potentially more one bedrooms could meet that need, both size wise and rent wise, but that's not what the market's providing at the moment. Um, the county does a lot for affordable housing. I've got, uh, that's Cameron Preserve up there, and I've got a list of some of the projects we've done in the last several years. We have our consolidated plan, we have state and federal funding that we spend, and we have our comprehensive plan and our land development code. We have gone in and done a lot in our plan and our code to encourage affordable housing, and we have streamlined our permitting process. A lot of the, the traditional steps a local government takes to try to facilitate affordable housing. And we should keep doing these things. They're good things, but they're not enough. We need to do more. And we need to recognize that we as a local government do not provide housing. The private market provides housing. We have a shortage of, or we have a need for whatever that need is for um, thousands and thousands of households. We're not going to be able to, to meet that need without working with the market. And, at this point, I generally stop talking about affordable housing. At this point, this is just housing. When you have that many households, working households, who can't afford what's on the market, when you have a fundamental mismatch between what's in the market and what your needs are, it's really time to stop and ask, are there market-based strategies we could be using to help? And so that's kind of what we've done. And this is a continuum, you know, if you're, if you're earning 50,000, you're covered. If you're earning 20,000, the market's probably never going to provide anything that's affordable to you. I, probably never. So you've got this gap. The lower the income goes, the less your needs are being met. Our question was, can we narrow this gap? Is there, are there things we can do beyond what we've already done to narrow this gap? And we think the answer to that is yes. You can do this one of two ways. You can decrease housing costs, or you can increase income and ability to pay. And what I mean by that is, um, and I'll talk specifically about one of the major expenses people have, which is transportation. If you can decrease how much people pay for transportation, you're putting more money in their pocket for housing. So there's a couple different ways to do this. Um, and that's where housing type comes in. Um, we want to decrease costs by increasing housing diversity. And the reason we want to do that, I think in, in Osceola County last year, 85% of what was built or three bedroom or more single family homes. But a three or four bedroom single family home is not going to work for a household earning $35,000 a year. I pulled up a, a mortgage calculator site and just did a quick analysis. And if you are a $35,000 a year household and you have $10,000 for a down payment and you have absolutely no debt at all, you can afford about a $150,000 house, which you might be able to find somewhere. 
if you add three hundred dollars three hundred dollars of debt that amount goes down to one hundred ten and if you add six hundred dollars of debt that amount goes down to about sixty five thousand so and if you think about what a car payment is you know these are some very basic expenses that most households have so the reality is we don't have a lot of thirty five thousand dollar households that have zero debt in the first place but they are in way too unstable a situation to have that kind of burden. They need a different product. And so, um, so what we're going to talk about, and I think you're going to hear this from other folks as well, is something called missing middle. If you look at this um, graphic, you see detached single family homes on one end, and you see um, mid-rise apartments on the other end. And I think this is in your brochure that you picked up on the way in. There are a whole lot of types in between, and those types don't really exist in the home building market in any great volume today. And part of that is when we went on our building spree to meet the needs of the baby boom, we did it in a suburban pattern. And these don't necessarily fit in a suburban pattern. If you have um, the home building industry building hundreds of homes at a time, they don't tend to mix in the different types. So we don't see a lot of this. This has disappeared from the market. What we want to do is try to bring this back because it provides a lot of affordable housing. So um, in Osceola County right now, this is what we have. We have single family housing, we have garden apartments, um, 275 units and up, and we have townhomes. And that's kind of the extent of the product we're seeing being provided on the market. What I'm going to do is talk about um, different products, and that's why we're here. Um, but first I want to say something about density, because a lot of people are very afraid of density. And I think they're afraid not of density so much as of scale. And hopefully this picture gets that across. That's scary to me. That's probably five units to the acre. But um, it looks very, very dense to me. And when you as local elected officials, especially here, a development's coming in and the neighbors come in and they say, this is going to make my problem worse. If it's something like this, they could very well be right. But it's not the density, it's not the units per acre. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. These are some of the things that we don't get in our um, housing. This is a garage apartment in the back of a house. Um, tend to be much more affordable than, and perfect for a one-person household. Uh, these are cottage homes. You might see them called bungalow courts. You see they have the parking in the back. This is about 12 units to the acre. And you can put this on, um, if you've separated your subdivision into lots, you can take two lots and you can put 12 units to the acre. Um, this is a courtyard apartment. Once again, it's 12 units. It's uh, got parking in the back. And this is on half an acre. So this is 24 units to the acre. But nobody around it cares. It has million dollar houses backing up to it. And that, I'm going to sneak ahead a little bit, that's because of the development pattern. And that's why the development pattern matters. Uh, this one is a single building. It is um, six units. It's the equivalent of 33 units to the acre. Once again, surrounded by single family housing, half a million dollars and up. Uh, this is two four unit buildings. And if you look in the back, you can see the parking structure. Um, this is the equivalent of 25 units to the acre. Once again, it looks, it's made to look like single family. It fits into a single family neighborhood, but it is a very high density. Um, this is micro units, and I don't know the density of this, but this is um, something that we don't generally see here. We're seeing it in South Florida. In fact, we have a speaker who's going to talk about micro units. Um, but it is something that could meet our needs potentially, especially when we consider how many smaller households we have. Um, we've made housing bigger and bigger and bigger, but we can make an efficient small unit. It can fit, this is a single building that can fit in an urban environment. These are the kinds of housing that provide what we sometimes call invisible density. And I looked at a, at a neighborhood downtown where I pulled some of those um, products. And these are single family neighborhoods, but they're mixed neighborhoods. And the density in these neighborhoods is eight or nine units to the acre gross, even though they've got single family in there. It's, it's all integrated. Um, but you're not going to get these kind of products in a suburban environment. If you have a disconnected road network, you have a lot of the same type of housing. 
in part, and actually a big reason you're not going to get these in a suburban environment is cars. Um, you saw the car chart where we have more and more two and three car families. You're not going to be able to park, basically. And so you can't put in something that's six units on a single lot because where are the cars going to be? That's the sort of issue that we have with the existing development pattern, and that's what we are working on. Um, we have in our comprehensive plan what are called mixed-use districts. This is one of them. Um, they have a mix of uses. They have the homes, the jobs, and the services are close by. Um, all kinds of housing types are allowed by right, and we are actually trying to expand that. Um, they're walkable and they're multimodal. And here's why that's important. For transit to be viable, you've got to have density and you've got to have a connected road network. If you don't have those things, transit is not viable. And this chart shows, this chart shows, um, percent of jobs reachable in 90 minutes by transit. It has the top 10 areas and the bottom 10 areas. And so we are 95th of 100. Um, only 15.8% of our jobs can be reached in 90 minutes by transit. Uh, we're saved by Palm Bay from being the worst one in the, in the state. <laughs> but uh, you, you notice four of the 10 in the bottom, top in the bottom 10 are Florida. So the, the development pattern affects the ability to use transit. And studies show when transit is available, low income households use it. And they don't necessarily need as many cars. And that's where we talk about decreasing other expenses for households. Housing is the number one expense for households. Transportation is number two. And what we find in Osceola County is if you have one worker in the household, they got one car, two workers, you got two or more cars, three workers, three or more cars. You can't have a job without a car. We think that's why a lot of people live in the motels, at least one reason, because there is transit out there and because they are close to their jobs. It's, it's maybe one of the only ways you can do that without having a car. And if you think back to my example of what a $35,000 household could afford, if they have car payments, they're not buying a house. So it's, it's very significant expense for a lot of households. Um, in fact, when you look at housing and transportation costs together, Osceola County is less affordable than places like Montgomery County, which is right outside DC, New York City, Austin, Portland, places you would think of as being a lot more expensive. And it's almost all because of the transportation cost. So if we can change that pattern, and we can make it so they need maybe fewer cars. It would be a long time before they get by with no cars. But maybe they need fewer cars. Then it's possible for them to cut down on a major expense and maybe even take on another job. So how do we do that? Once again, we increase proximity, a mix of uses, things close by. We increase walkability. And we create a pattern that makes transit viable. This not only makes it easier for them to get around and not have to pay as high transportation costs, it makes it possible for us to provide the products we want to provide because we don't necessarily need as much parking. So summing it up, I think what worked before for us, the single family model that worked so well for the baby boomers, it just may not be the best model going forward. And we have a lot of um, institutionalized strategies that emphasize home ownership in a way that doesn't necessarily meet our needs. So um, the American dream didn't always used to be about home ownership, but it has been co-opted to mean home ownership. Um, but it's not really going to work for everybody. So what we're doing here in the county is um, we've got the mixed use districts and we are working, we actually have a developer on our um, panel here who's gonna talk about some of the initial development in that district and how he is able to build in a variety of housing types and how he thinks he'll be able to reach markets that we haven't been able to reach at a lower level without subsidy, without um, government assistance. And that's what we're trying to get to. Um, we have the mixed-use districts. It's 50,000-plus acres. But even in our low-density residential districts, we are looking to go in, build in centers, build in connectivity, build in a variety of housing types, um, which we think will benefit not only the folks in those areas, but provide more housing options for people who need them. 
Um, we have already amended our land development code. We did a total redo, but we're going back in to build in as many housing types as possible. If we have somebody come in and want to do a bungalow court, I don't want them to be slowed down because the setbacks aren't right. So we're going in to build that in. We have identified some builders who build diverse products, and we are looking in other parts of the nation to see where these folks are because other people have this, if they have more density, if they have less land, they've, they've varied their types. We aren't there yet with the less land, but we're there with the need. Um, and then we are doing everything we can to facilitate the development of these mixed use areas. It's a challenging development strategy, and we want to make sure we give those developers everything they need to be able to develop those districts. And I think that's it. And that's it for mine, and I think I am going to introduce Alberto, who's coming up next. Our mission's good to be back. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know which button we're pushing, but no, pushing. Beeping, so for some of you, it's repeating. But anyway, oh. tell them that. Okay. Okay, next up is Alberto Vargas. Um, just as a, re a reminder, we will be entertaining questions at the end of um, the workshop. We now want to take a closer look at some of the topics our regional group has been working on. Um, Alberto Vargas is. Um, uh, has, is serving as the planning manager for Orange County since November 2012, where he is responsible for long-range planning, current planning, and urban design and placemaking. Alberto has 20 years of experience in planning and urban design. Um, he co-founded Martin and Vargas Design, where he designed um, and planned projects for public and private clients around the world. He previously served as Winter Park's uh, first town architect, and also as the city's uh, assistant planning director, Alberto. Okay, as soon as uh, we get my presentation up, we get started. Good morning, everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, We've been part of this conversation now for about um, a year, and it's been um, extremely uh, engaging and challenging from every single aspect. Um, we, we, we have been trying to take this at a, from, from the macro to the micro, where we talk about the regional aspects of it. We begin to talk about strategies. We, we talk about how to begin to identify a formula that helps us uh, better define and understand the components of um, how to successfully address our challenge. And the challenge is affordable housing. How do we collectively better un begin to better understand how the different local governments and our internal uh, regulatory structures begin to work collectively with the um, private sector to begin to address uh, some of the uh, strategies moving forward. So um, now that we're up, I, I'll, my, my emphasis today is talk about a little twist of affordable housing, and it is the affordable lifestyle. I think you heard Mitchell talk a little bit about the millennial and how millennials are beginning to, to dominate uh, the generation, the 29% of the population of this um, great country. And uh, we need to think a uh, little bit different and strategically about that because they, 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 they do things in a slightly different way. Um, so affordable lifestyle begins to address uh, the fact that our challenge does not only talk about um, the, the regulations and the toolkits, but it also talks about people. And we need to understand that. This challenge is not only about how we get there from a structure, but also people. So I'm going to start by addressing that, the residents and their sentiments really matter, and that's the, uh, the concept of NIMBYism and YIMBYism, and I will define those, talk about the, the various uh, housing types, and uh, we'll do the numbers as well to talk about how do we begin to implement that, as well as um, how much design really matters in this process. So what is uh, a NIMBY? I mean, I'm sure that everybody's been around since the 80s, so I'm sure everybody has heard uh, the nomenclature and um, the fact that um, it is not, not in my backyard. There's a lot of that. We hear it every single 
week almost when we talk about projects, uh, residents react to what's happening in their na neighborhoods. There is also the, uh, the, the YIMBYs, who is the sentiment that of the individuals, different generations and different residents, neighbors, that believe that housing and densities, as Susan talked a little bit about, it's okay. And we need, we, they recognize that there is a deficiency in terms of um, housing patterns within um, our region, and they, they are accepting it. What we want to arrive to is that, that uh, to address the balance between the two. I think that that is the safe haven that we're all collectively as a region beginning to try to understand. The you're welcome in my community type of approach. And that really begins to address that balance, the complete community balance that we talk about, the preservation of the neighborhood character, which is what everybody fears. You know, it's, we're moving away from that. That new development is going to change the way we experience our quaint neighborhood. That's what we hear consistently. Uh, that balance between jobs and housing is also critical, and that affordable and livable lifestyle is uh, what, what, what we are beginning to also allude to when we collectively address the challenge. I would like to, this morning, focus to a little bit zooming into the micro. Uh, you, you will hear quite a bit about how we're addressing the challenge at a regional uh, level, but I would like to talk a little bit about transit-oriented development, an opportunity that we have locally in Orange County to, to look at um, one of these modules in terms of um, a, a land development code update that we're currently undergoing. And uh, when we look at the county, what has helped us better focus in terms of diverse character, development pressures, and, and character of neighborhoods uh, has been uh, structuring of um, market planning. And uh, we have I just identified on the screen um, the market areas of Orange County, and that is, is an, it begins to organize the way that the land development code is being, or, is, is being structured, as well as our comprehensive plan reorganization uh, with, within uh, this next couple of, couple of uh, months and um, and uh, we would, I'd like to just talk a little bit about how this particular tool has, is beginning to address the fact that when we have a vision that is 23 years from today, we're looking at 2040, um, and we are able to use that organizational tool to help us focus into market areas that, that identify the market uh, area in terms of the percentage of the economy within three specific market areas within the county, 74% of uh, the total county employment is happening within the core, which is where the city of Orlando is located, uh, the southwest market area, Horizon West, and the south market area, Innovation Way. So the, that particular um, emphasis in focusing where applicability of these strategies that we're talking about is really critical and important. The reason why I, why I identify that is because it also helps us better understand the employment centers and um, transit corridors. And where all of those dynamics are happening, we're beginning to focus into suitable areas for applicability of some of these strategies. So let me be a little bit more specific with you this morning to talk about um, SunRail and what's happening at a regional level in terms of development within those station areas. Zooming into Pine Castle, this is, this is what we have right now, basically a blank canvas. And I will detail throughout my presentation some of the specific components, but this is the station area that is a kiss and rye, surface parking, great opportunity for applicability of what we're talking about today. But let me just go north with you and take you with me on a ride, on a transit ride, to better understand the um, you know the the, part, the type of um, of riderships that are that are going on right now as of January of this of this year the Pine Castle is station is has the highest number in terms of ridership in in within the the, the transit corridor of Sunrail um, compared to all the other ones to the north it is the terminus it is the southernmost terminus for the first phase as you know and that may be triggering it but it could also potentially become the hub that connects 
the Orlando International Airport, as well as to um, I, I Drive and the I Drive District. <clears throat> so let me just keep going north. Um, this is the Florida Hospital Station. This is what's happening right now under construction. If you have visited this general area, um, will be completed next year. Um, quite a bit of, of, of 57,000 square foot of commercial with um, a good, great number of uh, residential units um, within about a seven acre uh, area, as well as um, you know the, ci the city of Winter Park. There's got some other uh, development happening, not not affordable at all. This is, um, uh, this, this is pushing the $3 million uh, per townhouse um, structure right here. But it's happening within walking distance of the station area. Um, you have all, all heard, and you've seen it on the construction, the Maitland Center. Um, Maitland is trying to reinvent itself as um, a discernible downtown, and they're doing it very, um, quickly in terms of how densification is happening. Quite a bit of units right here. Um, with the price range goes all the way up to, in terms of $2,495 um, rent a month. Um, and the, the, the size of the units range between, between 616 square feet all the way to over 1,300 square feet. So you can see the diversity, the mix of uses that they're trying to do. This is another example just up north, Mainland Station Apartments. And uh, this, this happens to be in Longwood. Um, this is the Western Park at Longwood Station, quite a bit of um, you know, mostly residential within the same type of range and scale of residential units. This is in Lake Mary. You know, a lot of housing construction around the stations within walking distance of all of these particular stations. So let me take you back to, to Pine Castle for a second, where we have structured, you've heard, we've heard this morning quite a bit about the individual units, and the only way that we can get to that diversity is by codifying it. When we talk collectively about a code and a code update internally within Orange County, we have identified the fact that we need to move away from separating uses and coding uses and going into more of a form-based approach. Form-based approach gets you to that character of urban thriving environment that is not only attracti attractive to the local residents because they'll have within walking distance of established neighborhoods areas to uh, go, but also it's also applicable for, for the opportunity of dense, higher density housing at the scale that we're talking about for, and, and also the different diversity that we're talking about. So let, let, me, let me get started with um, dissecting this particular area for you. This is the Pine Castle District, about 500 plus acres of an area. And I'm going to um, just go ahead and, and identify the, 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 by transect zone, the station area right now, which this is, this is um, uh, zooming into the character of potential infill and redevelopment of, of that area, it takes us to um, a, a mixed-use environment uh, with buildings up to, you know, from five to eight stories um, and opportunity to, to mix the uses of residential, commercial, and perhaps even some office environment. So if I, if I zoom into that particular transect zone and I zoom into one particular area, we look at the opportunity to do smaller scale apartments, and they're called nomenclature is apartments. Um, this is part of the what? These are about 350 square feet manufactured modular apartments. Some of them are, not all of them necessarily, but this gives you the opportunity for faster, quicker uh, implementation of such, and that's happening throughout uh, the nation, you know, incrementally. Austin, Texas is doing it, uh, Denver. Um, Efficiency storage, flex spaces, and mix of uses is part of the development. This is the character inside uh, of some of those units, um, appealing to some of these younger generations as well. When we, when we move forward to another transit zone within this particular district, we can zoom in and look at the, the other um, type of scale and how we're zooming, we're, how we're decreasing densities, and as we get closer to more established neighborhoods, and we can begin to identify the type of product that could potentially happen within a mixed-use building as well. So trans the, the, TF, the Transect uh, 5 area begins to provide the opportunity for a mix of uses. So let me zoom into one of those where, where 
micro apartments could be part of that transect zone as well with the same scale, 300 square feet plus. Um, kitchenette um, opportunities with uh, alcove in terms of bed alcoves, polished concrete in terms of the finishes, so more rustic finishes within this. Um, development types, um, very creative storage uh, areas and, and very large windows are usually part of those. So we zoom into the transit edge area of, of, the, of, the, of a cross section of, um, of the missing middle portion of this um, station area, we see the possibility of live work units. You know, live work units are also uh, one of those housing types that can be well incorporated within this particular zones, within this particular uh, transit oriented development area. And this is what they look like. Uh, live work units uh, provide you the opportunity to have housing on top of your shop or at, at, on top of um, an office. So this big brings the opportunity to have a um, photo, photo studio or a lawyer's office or an architectural studio, whichever way um, the flex open space uh, would be um, uh, an opportunity for the first floor to be converted into perhaps even part of the housing unit. So there's flexibility there. Uh, the T4 edge, um, when we zoom into this particular one, it gives us the, the uh, type of housing that um, is, is about pocket neighborhoods um, as well, where we can create strategic densities in areas that it, it is acceptable to have uh, pocket neighborhoods. So this is, this is what, what it would look like in, incorporated within these transect zones. We're moving away from that um, uh, live work unit, getting more into the scale of single family homes, but this creates larger, larger densities within um, you know, areas that are more open, that are a little bit more separated in terms of uh, spacing between single family home units. And so setbacks are really important. And when, once we move into this single family, more established neighborhoods, other opportunities that we're talking about in terms of the regional opportunities here is the accessory dwelling units. And that's what I'm zooming into right now, which gives us uh, an opportunity to, to activate uh, another type of livable uh, environment within a single family home that makes the primary unit as well as the secondary unit affordable. So let me just talk about that first one first, the pocket neighborhood um, scale environment where we begin to address the fact that these this have larger scale units at 1,000 to 1,200 square feet um, they have shared amenities, you know, that common uh, courtyard in the center where there is quite a bit of uh, opportunities that go on at a neighborhood scale level. Um, and the, 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 the detached or attached um, ADUs, which is the accessory dwelling units at um, perhaps 400 square feet. And here we immediately see a conflict within our existing codes. You know, we, in terms of uh, this type of units, we cannot do anything sh shorter or smaller than 500 square feet. So we're looking at how we can begin to address not only uh, smaller footprints of an ADU, but also an opportunity to have family members as well as other renters that are not necessarily family linked to be able to um, take advantage of this housing type as well. So let's do the numbers for a minute. Um, when I talk about, about Pine Castle and TOD District, and I, when we talk about a quarter mile radius from the um, station itself, it's a five minute walk. And when I zoom into this particular area, just because we know exactly what's going on here, we know that we have 90 acres, 60 upland developable acres. We apply our tool, the first tool that this region has been talking about in terms of access and opportunity, suitability for where we should be thinking of applying some of these strategies um, in terms of affordable housing. We look, we begin to better understand the character and the ranking of accessibility, which is access to services, access to jobs, and travel cost, as well as uh, the, the neighborhood opportunity for education, as well as labor market, and the ranking of that. So together, uh, this, it highlights this area as extremely highly suitable within this module 
that we're talking about in terms of the access and opportunity model uh, for affordable housing and suitability. So when we look at um, the opportunity in terms of incre incremental growth of this kiss and ride surface parking lot station, the, the southernmost, the one that has the highest ridership within Sunrail, we want to we wanna look at how how some of these strategies are applicable to the existing incremental growth over the next 23 years. So if, if this is a potential, what you see there, which is non, not, not necessarily threatening, um, because right now it's a surface parking lot, it could grow, those 60 acres could grow up to be quite interesting in terms of a development program. This is all hypothetical, but it, it, it is in terms of what we're talking about in terms of uh, the, the future land use designations and uh, the coding um, that is associated to this area, we're looking at a potential growth within these 60 acres of uh, 165 square feet, potential multifamily number of dwelling units over 3,000 in office space uh, as a combination of 41,000 square feet. So how do we get there? If we were to apply some of these inclusionary components that we're talking about at specific percentages, we're able to take that potential development program and identify the fact that if we were addressing a 5% affordable housing element here, associate, directly associated with density <coughs> bonus, um, at a 5% requirement, we would be getting out of that development program 179 affordable dwelling units, 10%, 358, and at 15%, 536. That's just a quick snapshot of uh, what could potentially happen within the next 23 years in this one station um, within the, the, the Sunrail station area. So let me just do some specific assumptions here to talk about um, the density bonus approach if this is one of the tools that we will be talking about within the next three months as we conclude our strategies. And I'm going to focus into one particular block. This is a 2.5 acre block, just zooming into that particular building right here. This is a, 70, uh, a 65 wide building that is a liner building around a parking structure. Um, and I, uh, you know, when we look at this, um, it, it is a long, uh, a long term of 15 years, and um, the average unit size is about 1,000 square feet, just an, on an average. Um, and, and the number of units per floor is 15 units per floor. So just keep that in mind for a second. And we're going to run into a few scenarios. Like if we, if we have this market rate development, it would, it would, it would have a monthly rent of a total of 75 units at five stories of $1,300 a month, okay? Fairly consistent to what you just saw happening north of, San, of the Pine Castle Station within all of the stations um, that we highlighted today. So pretty comparable. That's the market, right? That, that's really the market today. Um, the return on the investment of the, to, towards that, the 15-year um, loan would be about 9.29%. Um, so that's market rate. If we begin to introduce at 80% AMI, 20% of those units, um, the monthly rate would be about $1,022 per, per month, um, and at 60% at 60 AMI would be 766 you can see that the average rent and 50% and would be about 638. So we begin to better understand the applicability of this with the requirement of code um, in terms of adding the density bonus to be able to balance that performa at a market, uh, at, a, at a development perspective to be able to keep, this is the summary right here. The, the average rent for this particular building would be about 1,334. What this snapshot shows is that with three different uh, scenarios, mixed use income one, two, and three, the, the, the return on the investment on, on those 15 years is within 0.5%. If we're able to better understand how the combination of a percentage of inclusionary approach of affordable housing with the density bonus, which if we have a five-story limit, 
we add two stories to be able to create that balance. Th this is a, a snapshot of what we're talking about. Design really matters, and that's where the NIMBYism and the NIMBYism perspective of local residents comes about. We need to be able to emphasize good design because it determines the su success of affordable housing. We need to address the fact that um, the acceptance of uh, inclusive communities is healthy and it, is, it makes the neighborhood thrive. Uh, we need to talk about um, how we ensure quality for compatible architecture. You, you should not be able to discern from one particular building to the other or even within the building itself that, they, that it contains affordable units. I mean, that is the bottom line. Everything that we saw north of, of um, the Pine Castle Station, it could, they could very well be mixed units, and you should not be able to see the difference. Provide opportunities for housing diversity. You know, this, these are all the reasons why design is really important. Uh, management also becomes extremely important in some of these developments. Uh, maintenance standards are critical. You, you should not be able to say that that particular property is not being maintained because it is affordable in nature. Um, through the screening of, of residents, you know, we need to be specific about what we want to relax and what we want to continue to emphasize. Uh, make management visible and accessible. Management should be always accessible. And the challenge, uh, challenge the, the perceptions out there that make people and residents react to not in my backyard uh, sentiment. The questions that we continue to hear is that high density and affordable housing will cause too much traffic. Well, the reality is that when we're talking about transit-oriented development and opportunities of infill, people who live in affordable housing own fewer cars and drive less. I mean, bottom line. Um, high density development strains public services and infrastructure because the perception out there, higher density. Um, the compact development offers greater efficiency in use of public services and infrastructure. That is a fact. Um, high density and affordable housing undermine the community character. Well, what we talked about today is that not necessarily it can make it good, good um, incorporated affordable housing could be part of the whole. It should not be discerned from the market rate housing. And high density and affordable housing increase crime fact is that design and the use of space, if you're able to orient buildings where they're supposed to be, use all the principles of crime uh, prevention through environmental design, as well as other um, strategies, you're, you're able to address the fact that density is not the problem or the issue. So let me close by identifying the top five um, key, el key elements that we need to continue to remind ourselves, that we need to foster community uh, and safety and pride, uh, we need to continue to strive for that curb appeal, foster the sense of ownership, put the eyes on the street and community sensitive design. We need to be able to continue to use our formula. We talked about this access and opportunity model that is now accessible at a regional level. We need to use it. We need to be able to identify those sites that are suitable, that are close to services, jobs, and transit and are, are close to um, day, daycares and uh, schools and recreation and, and jobs as well. Uh, sustainability is huge. We just had a, a very well engaged millennial workshop uh, l last week where sustainability was part of the dialogue and uh, building community trust. Um, outreach and engagement is very, very important um, and it needs to be started extremely quickly in the process. The, the sooner that we engage our local residents to be part of the overall development, especially if it's changing the character of the over, overall area, it is, um, it is important to involve them early and in every way possible. Um, so the formula for success in closing is we use our where, as Mitchell introduced it, this is our model, plus our what, which is the diverse character of units, divided by the how, which is the strategies that we're talking about, at the end gives us our affordable housing lifestyle formula for success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Next up is Jason Burden. He's gonna to talk to us a little bit more about the missing middle. Uh, Jason is the chief planner with the city of Orlando, practicing various land development capacities as a professional planner for over 23 years. 
During his past 13 years with the City of Orlando, Jason has been the sitting zoning official, managed the city's land development process, and now works with a studio of planners, architects, and economic development professionals to create a vision for sectors of the city and proposing new land development codes. Jason? Thanks. Hi, I'm Jason Burton. I'm chief planner with the city of Orlando. Um, one thing about me, I've almost a quarter of a century been working as a, uh, as a professional planner, both here in central Florida for the last 13, 14 years, but also I was for a decade in Silicon Valley. I was a planner with the city of San Jose. I kind of went from the worst housing market in the nation to another kind of worst housing market in the nation. But the, the interesting thing is that the solutions are sort of similar in both situations. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of perspective on that. What I'm going to start off with is really there's a dichotomy, I think, about how people think about urban development. You think about, you know, downtown Orlando and high rises and these large um, mid-rise developments, and then you're thinking about your typical suburban development that Susan mentioned in, in suburban areas. You've got single-family neighborhoods, you've got garden apartments, and you've got these townhouse subdivisions sometimes, but really these are the most expensive ways of delivering housing. The price per square foot of actually building um, high-risk development is extremely expensive. Um, housing itself in a suburban environment takes a lot of land, takes a lot of cost, takes a lot of transportation in order to do. So really what Susan kind of introduced to you and what I'll submit is that we really forgot as cities how to make this beautiful urbanism or walkable urbanism that everybody wants to live in. We basically outlawed it. So we kind of have a hangover from a post-World War II um, um, situation going. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's, it's happened in the United States is because we really subsidize mortgages. We don't subsidize housing. We subsidize mortgages. And that's resulted in our suburban development plan. So you really have to think about how you build, plan, and accommodate this type of missing middle housing, which is so much in demand. And really, it's going to be more compatible with, um, with your existing neighborhoods compared to you know, putting a big high-rise next to somebody's house, which is not going to be a very great solution. Um, and despite that, that it's largely illegal to do this type of development within our cities, you really have to address property rights concerns, I'm thinking. Um, the state legislature keeps on asking us every year to start addressing property rights as, as growth management plan elements. And I think this really gives our citizens and the small guys and property owners the ability to create local wealth and can be responsive to these needs that are at the state level. You know, you could have, allow for homes to be where the jobs are and have a, a certain amount of location efficiency. It's also about the urban development where people actually want to live, where you can have walkable urbanism, supports a variety of needs, ages, allows you to age in place. I could have my grandma come live with me. I can have my little millennial sister come live with me. You know, those things would be okay. These types of units tend to be smaller, more affordable units, and are more responsive to the marketplace. It's the best bet for increasing our density, increases walkable urbanism, but I'd also submit there's something else. Um, in the age of the federal government and HUD and CDBG loans, I don't see the federal government coming down to solve affordable housing crises in our neighborhoods. But if, if you really think about it, um, and, and, and even though these inclusionary housing zoning and, and linkage fees, which other people will, will start to talk about to you in subsequent workshops, they're really not the complete picture unless we actually concentrate on doing this missing middle because they're not, they're noble pursuits, but they're not, they don't have the potential to really increase the marketplace for units throughout our whole entire um, our region. So really let's let the market decide, you know, I don't mind living in Melrose Place, you know, in that courtyard apartment down there in the tic-tac-toe in the lower right-hand corner or, you know, being in a duplex or a garage apartment, which is, are these places that we really have to effectively remember how to put back into our communities. We've already been over this, but there's a real need to look at af housing affordability. It's very expensive. I actually broke it down for the city of Orlando, and it was quite interesting to me that nearly 45% of all of the households within the city of Orlando are cost burdened. And I broke it down even for different housing our households incomes, very low income, more than 94% of our very low income households are, house, are, are 
housing cost burden. Even moderate income levels are 50 percent housing cost burden. But really, that's an incomplete picture, and, and it's going to expand even more by 2030. But really, it's, it's an incomplete picture of looking at housing affordability because, like Susan mentioned earlier, we really need to look at transportation costs. And just you, you'll want to write down this website because it's really cool. Um, the Housing Transportation um, Index by CNT, the Center for Neighborhood Technology, is a really effective tool at looking at this. And you can actually dial into neighborhoods and figure out this cost. And they've modeled it for the entire United States, and it's, it's a really cool thing. One thing about Orlando, though, is once you put it out in, 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 into the model, if you look at it, the entire region, there's not one single location-efficient neighborhood with, within our region. And they define that as being 45% with your housing and transportation costs together. And if you look at different places, the city of Orlando, 53% um, of your, your, your cost will come to, on average, your median income household would be, 50, would be spent on housing and transportation. You're going to have a 1.55% auto ownership rate there. But the other interesting thing about it is looking at different locations throughout our city. And if you dial into the, the tool, you'll notice that in downtown Orlando is actually more affordable to the median income person than Metro West, which is kind of shocking. So I challenge you all to go to your own jurisdictions and look at this. And I've pulled up some choice examples for you. <laughs> in, in the city of Winter Garden, 65% of your income is going to be spent for a median income household on both um, um, housing and transportation costs. City of Sanford does a little bit better at 50%. City of Kissimmee, about 50% too. So they're not quite underneath that 45% um, housing and transportation costs, but they're doing better. And I'll submit, trying to figure out where missing middle can go is most responsive to creating those types of units that are going to be locationally efficient. And most of our cities have zoning maps like this where you see a sea of yellow. Does everyone know what the yellow means? It means single family zone places. And this is in my own city and what should be some of the most densest places. We, we actually did rezone large swaths of it to accommodate duplex development, which I'm going to go over later on. But it's really how do we start to fit this into this type of environment. And I'm, I'm just going to step back and look at a tale of two cities because, as I mentioned, you, everyone familiar with Vancouver? Anyone been there? No? Someone's been there. Great. They kind of have the same type of a challenge. They're really in that dichotomy of an environment where you either live in these, these large multi-story apartment buildings or you're in a single family neighborhood and they just started to implement accessory alley dwelling units in those particular areas and they have a problem with the missing minerals. At least they've gotten transit oriented design but if you contrast that with the city of Montreal where every single neighborhood is able to do missing middle um, um, apartment multifamily units, they don't have those yellow peanut butter throughout the whole entire city. The cost of housing in Montreal, since I can pick on Canada, is about a third of that of Vancouver. So just think about that for a little while. And you know, it's a much more European style type of a city rather than you're a high rise um, type of environment. So really the elements of bringing back missing mill, and I'm gonna start and really think about lifestyles. And the really interesting thing that I, I decided to pull up here, this is our traditional city, our pre-World War II city demographics. And as you can see, the Generation X really started the urbanization trend. Basically, I'm, I'm so Gen X, I could have been a character in a, in a John Hughes movie. But um, millennials don't, aren't in our urban population centers as much as Generation X. But as you can see, they have the most potential to come. 20% um, are, are millennials in Generation X at 31.5%. So. What they want, the millennials as well as the Gen X, is they want walkable urbanism. They want smaller dwelling units, those places where they can kind of rest their heads and then go out into the environment and experience life at our cafes or main streets and different locations throughout and, and live that living, urban lifestyle. Well, some of the solutions, and, and I'm just going to advocate for um, accessory dwelling units. There's six accessory dwelling units in here in this particular picture in Baldwin Park. You know, you can have an accessory dwelling unit in the city of Orlando um, in certain areas, but really we need to open up as a region to allowing more accessory dwelling units. 
This is a casita that's actually in Laureate Park where you put the accessory dwelling unit in front of it. It'd be a great place for my band to practice, I think. Um, accessory dwelling units here in the city of Orlando, what we've done is really limited them um, to being accessory apartments on 25% of your gross floor area of your principal unit, but they're allowed by right on lot sizes of 1.5 times the minimum lot size. Accessory cottage dwellings, when they're separated, they're allowed to be up to 40% of the principal structure, but we give a minimum of up to 700 square feet and up to 1,200 square feet maximum, which is actually quite a large unit. Um, and those are allowed by right on lots up to two times the minimum lot size. And of course, we allow them by right on practically all lots within those special plan developments from like Baldwin Park and Laureate Park. But what I would submit to you is that's really not enough. So I think there could be a vision that if every jurisdiction in this region, including the city of Orlando, allowed for accessory dwelling units less than 500 square feet, enough for a studio or one, a very small one bedroom apartment, and allow in all your conforming residential zoning districts, we would have the capacity to add a tremendous amount of housing to our region. Um, we have 100,000 households within um, the city of Orlando. That's potentially, it's just 1% of my city took me up on this offer, I'd create 1,000 dwelling units. If everyone in Orange County, and there's a half a million um, um, households or single family households in Orange County or in the region, that's that's potentially a half million additional units. So we really need to think about opening up. The benefit of this is it doesn't change the character of a particular neighborhood, allows for aging in place, and can stabilize your neighborhood, increases homeowners' property rights, being responsive to this, you know, the temperature at the state level. And you know what? Where people want to locate efficiently decreases overall vehicle miles traveled. So it reduces the amount of traffic overall than providing something else. And Alberto showed a couple pictures of these, and this is places where everybody wants to live because after all, don't you want your granny to come live with you? And this is my mother and my grandmother. <laughs> she, my grandmother is um, 95 years old. She, they both live in California. They could come live with me in Florida. My mother's retired. She's 68 years old. She could come with, live with me in Florida if she really wanted to and really ditch that old suburban house that she lived in. And you know that she would probably actually come live with me. Um, and besides that, every good sitcom involved a garage apartment that I can remember, so. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's what I want to say about accessory dwelling units. The city of Orlando has also been through a quite uh, an extraordinary story about trying to fit in duplexes into our city. And as you can see here, they've mostly been going into single family areas, what, we, what Alberta would term as the T3 suburban zone. And as you can see, these are taking the form more of a T4 townhouse type of thing. In fact, people call them townhouses, and that's just a mismatch. So one of the things that happened in the 60s, like I mentioned earlier, is we rezoned swaths of our community to accommodate duplex development and actually R2P zoning, which will allow small micro units up to five units to the acre. And we've gotten uh, <laughs> a history of really bad duplex development that doesn't quite fit into the neighborhood. So, and we'll get things that have gigantic, enormous um, parking lots in the middle of the houses. And this is really not the urban form that we wanted to encourage. So we had a lot of concerns. You know, garages are occupying most of the facade, driveways taking up most of the front yard. Garages and cars were dominant, large curb cuts, limited on-street parking, and really had limited opportunity for landscaping for fitting in. Um, but there was the opportunity to look at things like this, front-to-back duplexes that really fit in the context of that suburban environment a little bit more. So it looks more like single family, the garage is tucked in the back, um, units could be of different sizes, so you could have an owner and then you could rent out the property in the back, and that might actually help you with your mortgage in the end. But the concern has been, well, they have to share the driveways, you know. Um, and they, they tend to look a little bit better. And also on corner lots, we've had, we had some experience with doing tandem types of, of lots for quite a while. And these are two separated units on a particular property. And they're pretty much preferred over duplexes because they reduce the mass overall. And this was actually really popular in Silicon Valley where I came from. And we started seeing these all over the place. And we're starting to experiment more with this. But it's kind of getting there, but court home types of development where you have four units particularly um, smashed together with, with um, 
<laughs> smashed in, not quite, but um, um, sharing one particular driveway. But it really retains that single family character and was very popular in the South Bay area there in San Francisco. So how do we fit all these types of things? We have zoning-based regulations that we can figure out and then design-based regulations that Alberta mentions that are so important for us to consider. Um, setbacks, building heights, Florida area ratio limitations and whatnot. And just to address some of these ugly concerns, so we've essentially looked at the different types of urban forms that would be acceptable to us in the city of Orlando. We concluded that front to back duplexes were okay. Side to side with rear garages were okay. Corner lots, we required them to be tandem, so it reduces the mass overall. We allow tandems within our, within our R2 zones now. Um, we did it in the past because they thought that would thwart overall duplex development, so there's the unintended consequence of regulating development out and allowing for court homes. But the other thing that I wanted to mention, and Alberto touched on this, is really getting into the design review because there's, I'll get duplexes like this, and they're not the greatest thing but you can require architectural details, trim sills, decorative doors and windows, require articulations of the roof form, detailing and shutters, and really get a better type of product in the end. So if you're gonna implement that, there's experiences on how to do that. We have a whole entire handout at the City of Orlando table if you wanna know how to do it. Um, the last thing that I wanted to allude to is really setting the table for development for other types of missing middle um, housing. And this is a picture of Baldwin Park, has a variety of units from micro units all the way down to townhouses, garage apartments and everything in between, is it really takes a vision to set out and lay that out. And Alberta went out through that for the Sand Lake Station and I think that's really necessary for each of the municipalities to do this if you want to implement it. You can even have live work um, units in your T4 kind of transition zones at the edge of a town center like this is in Baldwin Park. Those units on the bottom could be live work, they could be businesses, they could be flexible enough to be loft units, and they are, and they sometimes transform. So everyone would like to see this type of development. So using Baldwin Park as an example, you've got to concentrate on what the urban form requirements that you're trying to create, make sure you have a discernible center, have a variety of housing styles and open space network, parking in the back, connectivity between uses, and you'll start to get that. But we we're really using that form-based transect that Alberto alluded to, to doing that. And what I've discovered is that as you're doing suburban development and trying to fit in more urban and missing middle housing is the transitions are important. They happen at mid-block, so it's more natural. And you never want to put an urban center next to your trans your, your suburban area, otherwise you'll get those NIMBYs at your public hearings. So there's a real way of designing this that you have to think about so you can have a continuous city. And then you can actually plan corridors out this way and, 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 and transform the community either through multiple projects or within projects themselves. We did this for downtown College Park and even though I'm not an architect, I can actually take out a pen and a pen and paper and start to look at this and really program what those transitions look like with the community. And you can kind of see um, the bullseye that we've created and those transitions that happen. Rather than just concentrating on where the uses were and drawing the zoning lines where they are, really con consider how you would imagine those, those activity centers growing over time. Set the table, make um, objectives and recommendations not only for urban form but transportation, parking, architectural details and how you're going to implement it and always go over urban form first because you want to know what the place is going to be before it grows up, before you can start to address all the other issues. Um, and then show people what it's going to look like as you're going to implement that particular vision. This is Edgewater Drive as we start to think about how it might grow up to be a city and, and be, be um, in a, incorporate more of that missing middle types, types of housing. Anyway, I put questions here, but we're gonna save those to the end. But in, in conclusion, I just wanted to talk about a couple other things. Um, as, of course, being from Silicon Valley, and I've actually worked on the Adobe headquarters, the eBay headquarters, and Cisco Systems were some of my projects. And I actually recently worked on the Amazon proposal for, our, for Central Florida. But these types of companies are looking for these types of urban environments, and they'll pass up your region unless you actually incorporate them. Um, Think about your regulations. Do you have really outdated and outmoded minimum requirements for housing for minimum sizes? 
Um, are you not catching up with the lifestyle choices that people want to make? Um, we'll never adapt into an innovation economy without this type of housing. And be realistic about your parking requirements citywide. Um, most jurisdictions could probably do well by having their parking requirements and making their old parking requirements the new maximum requirements. And the city of Orlando did that kind of in 1991, and we are pretty good for it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Seminole County and back to Mitch. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Okay, next up we have Donna King from Seminole County, and Donna's going to talk about um, some of the housing pro programs and code changes uh, that Seminole County is working on. Donna King um, has been serving as the Community Development Manager for Se Seminole County since June. Donna has over 22 years of local and state government experience in Central Florida, uh, with eight years dedicated to community development grant administration. Donna? Thank you. Um, again, I'm with Seminole County and I work for Community Services. And this presentation was done in cooperation also with our planning and development. So what Seminole County wanted to present to you is um, give you an idea of the programs we currently are Im implementing for affordable housing. Um, we, in Community Services, we are implementing and administering the grants that come from the state and federal government, including the SHIP grant. The HUD grants, the um, CDBG home grants, and we want to give you an idea of the, the types of um, housing programs we're doing with the money that we currently have. Also, we want to provide to you information on our current codes, land development codes, um, and what the options are for that housing. Um, So our current affordable housing strategies and programs um, is what we're currently implementing, the affordable housing regulatory framework, and also finish with the affordable housing options that we currently have within those codes for Seminole County. That includes the tiny homes and adaptive reuse. The current affordable housing strategies and programs is the, we have a homeowner rehabilitation reconstruction program. We also have a county-owned vacant lands available for development of affordable housing. We work in partnerships with nonprofit or organizations to develop affordable housing, and we also support the tax credit projects that are applied for within the um, jurisdiction of Seminole County. So this is an example of the Homeowner Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Program. Uh, bulk of the funds that we currently use goes towards our home owner occupied housing programs. Um, this is a, an example of a home that um, somebody was currently living in and we, they applied for our program. The home needed to be demolished because it was not livable um, and then we built a um, affordable housing unit for that person to move back into. We of course relocate them during the project. Um, and this is kind of the, the bulk of the money that is currently being spent in Seminole County for affordable housing. We also have a county-owned vacant lands program. The county-owned land that we have that's available for and determined suitable for development of affordable housing is um, determined through resolution by the Board of County Commissioners. Those vacant lands are then made available to nonprofits to develop affordable housing units for resale or rental to income eligible households. County might further subsidize the construction costs through federal or state grant programs. And um, we make sure that the units are continued affordability of those units is ensured through a binding agreement with a nonprofit. And we also put restrictive use covenants on the properties. Now these vacant lands are of course going to be more single family homes for development of single family homes. Um, this is a map of the current ones that we have available. We just recently went through a request for a proposal process. Um, so we're going to be um, 
deeding out about half of them. So we'll have about four left after, um, after all that is determined. We also work in partnership with nonprofits. Um, the funding that comes from the state and federal government supports the development and maintenance of affordable housing units. Units are developed in partnership with the local nonprofits for resale or rental to income eligible households. And the availability of funding for these projects is advertised on an annual basis and a request for proposal process is followed to solicit applications. We currently are in that process. Um, we held a workshop yesterday and that closing is going to be um, early in November. Currently, um, we don't, we haven't gotten too many um, new applications for rental projects through this program and um, it's something that we're currently working on developing those partnerships with new nonprofits and trying to bring them into Seminole County. This is an example of a recently finished project. Um, this is located in Longwood. Using home funds, um, we supported the development of um, eight affordable housing units that were um, rehabbed by the Habitat for Humanity. And in addition, we basically provided funding for four of them, but we also subsidized the um, affordability of the actual purchasers through our down payment assistance program for all eight of the units. This, and another thing is this is located in Longwood, very close to Sunrail Station, so the proximity um, to transportation was ideal. Seminole County supports tax credit projects um, by providing the local contribution that's needed for their applications. The um, Merritt Street tax credit project was just completed this year and provided an additional 102 affordable multifamily units, and this is in the area of Altamont Springs. Now the regulatory framework that we currently have is in our comprehensive plan, future land use element policies, our land development code, and there are some specific chapters that I'm gonna go over, just some, some things that provide some options already now for developers that are interested in providing, um, working with affordable housing in Seminole County. So this comprehensive plan policy, the objective future land use 10, allows up to seven dwelling units per acre in a low density residential area, up to 12 dwelling units per acre in medium density, and up to 22 dwelling units in high density for affordable housing. It's a sliding scale dependent on the percentage of units intended for low and very low income households. And then this is the enabling la language which is used for our um, residential affordable housing zoning districts. Future land use 10 allows reduced lot sizes and reduce open space shared community amenities in exchange for affordable units. It requires a binding agreement to ensure the units remain affordable when the occupancy changes. And then it allows for other uses, including child daycare, <coughs> neighborhood scale business when intended to serve affordable and workforce households in the moderate density and as permitted uses in higher density. So how does this policy benefit the developers? Um, for the regular, uh, you know, not affordable housing, the net density per acre according to our code is four dwelling units per acre for low, 10 for medium, and 20 for high. If they choose the alternate density option, that raises to seven, 12, and 22. So they can build more units in the same space using this without any um, any additional costs or anything from us, and this is already built into our code. Um, we also have affordable housing zoning districts. It's intended to promote the development of affordable housing with single family duplex, triplex, or zero lot line dwellings. Parcels with zoning cannot be less than five acres if all residential. If combined with non residential, the parcel must be a minimum of 10 acres and non-residential cannot exceed 5% of the net development acreage. The residential affordable housing district, 100% of the developed units in this district must be available to low and moderate income households, and not less than 40% must be available for rental or purchase by low income households. Allows the density increases up to 12 dwelling units for medium density and 22 for high density and the lot sizes and yards are reduced. Um, Seminole County Board of County Commissioners may waive all permit and inspection fees for um, 
developments in these affordable housing districts. And then this is a map of the current affordable housing um, zoning districts. The ones in the top right are in the Midway area of Sanford. Um, these are all in kind of the Sanford area of Seminole County. Then we also have the alternate density option. It's designed to encourage private sector participation in the development of affordable housing opportunities through de reduced development costs and reduced time required for development review to facilitate the process. And this is the alternate density option is for all the areas that are outside designated CDBG areas. Percentage of units within an alternate density option development set aside for low and very low income households shall be between 10 and 30 percent of the total units developed. This provision intends to ensure mixed use development and prevents pockets of low in income con concentration. And then the alternate density op option is not a separate zoning classification but rather a development option and applicants may apply through a streamlined pr procedure intended to facilitate <coughs> rapid and efficient review and consideration of the development. Okay, and now tiny homes. Um, these are photos of a tiny home, tiny home community that was built in Detroit, um, developed by a community social services organization to help low-income population to become um, homeowners. It's a rent-to-own program. And um, this community, you can tell that the houses are very close to each other. They are, you know, below 500 square feet, um, each of them. And um, it's a program that was completely developed by this, this nonprofit. And then we want to talk about, you know, what the options are for tiny homes within Seminole County and within the framework of our codes that we currently have. And that's per the Land Development Code. Units on wheels are considered a motor home and are per permitted currently only in RV parks and campgrounds for a temporary period of time. So the ones on wheels aren't going to really work as a permanent solution for affordable housing. Single family mobile home districts allows a mobile home without a minimum house size required to be anchored to a foundation as specified by the HUD standard for manufactured housing safety. And then um, tiny homes that are prefabricated and mounted on a concrete slab are considered manufactured or modular homes and can meet the Florida Building Code. Homes that are less than 500 square feet are currently permitted in the planned um, developments, in planned developments, and certain zoning districts, including um, A1, A3, and A10. And these zoning districts have no minimum house size. Now your tiny home can be the primary residence or an accessory dwelling unit. The accessory dwelling unit, the requirement for Seminole County is it can't exceed 35% of the primary residence. And then if you're in the A1 agriculture district, it has no minimum house size, tiny home could be the primary residence. This district also allows for a cottage or guest house without a kitchen. So options for the tiny homes, it can be in a planned development. Um, can, if you have a plan development approved, it can allow for a tiny home community and it just has to be consistent with the future land use um, density requirements. It can be applied to subdivision, multifamily rental units or condos. And in many of the other residential districts, a cottage or guest house is permitted outright or by special exception. And then outside of these locations, accommodating the tiny homes in other districts would require changes to our um, land development code. And then adaptive reuse is vacant or underused properties in suitable areas can be transformed into affordable housing units. And potential <coughs> properties considered good candidates for adaptive reuse includes um, vacant schools, office buildings, and retail buildings. And just the final photo I have is an adaptive reuse um, that was done in Chicago recently is an old Sears and Roebuck building that was abandoned and vacant for basically 40 years, was transformed into 181 affordable housing units that range in size from one to four bedrooms. So for Seminole County, we have a lot of, you know, Sunrail line. Um, it's something we would consider um, supporting if there's, you know, buildings that, that could be transformed and converted into housing. 
So this is the, the end of my presentation. Um, and again, we just wanted to let you know, you know, what we currently have in Seminole County, what the options are. We are currently working on, you know, creating new partnerships with um, nonprofits. Um, kind of right now we have the vacant lands and we also have um, uh, mostly more single family and we have the NOFA, but we are, you know, looking for um, people to really come to us with, with ideas as far as developments um, to, to increase the number of affordable units we have here in Seminole. Thank you. Okay, we are approaching the final stretch, so hang in there, everybody, and we'll, we'll, we'll make it together. Um, next up is Owen Beitch, and um, we are moving into a panel um, with some private sector um, folks who uh, are um, going to really be able to talk about um, affordable housing development and the process that they go through, some of the obstacles, mixed-use development um, from pac practitioners or, that are out there doing the work. And, um, and, and talk about the potential for housing diversity and affordability. So <clears throat> first up is Owen Beitch, and um, he's going to talk about uh, the economics of housing. Owen Beitch is presently the Senior Director of Economic and Real Estate Advisory Services for GAI Community Solutions Group. He is a founding member of Orlando Neighborhood Improvement Corporation, where he served as the organization's chair for four years. He serves on various uh, local boards and ad hoc committees exploring pol pol housing policy issues for both Orlando and Winter Park. In 2010, uh, the American Institute of Certified Planners named uh, Dr. Beisch a fellow, the highest honor bestowed on an urban planning profession. He is also a faculty member at UCF. Owen. Thank you very, very much, Mitch. This is a watch. Uh, my, my name is Owen. I am a baby boomer. I do not tweet. <laughs> I have too many cars and my house is too large. I'm, I'm here this morning basically to affirm, correct, and in some case amplify different things associated with the housing, real estate, and development industries so that they can offer some perspective on how we can fill some of these missing parts that have been described as occurring in the middle. What I want to do is spend a lot of time this morning within my allotted time frame talking about the marketplace, how we got where we are in many cases, outlining the history for many of you who are a lot younger than I am and may not appreciate yesterday's situation compared to today's, that that sets a foundation for what the trajectory might be. I do want to link some very, very specific economic observations with, I think, what are social and behavioral types of activity that I think helps understand why we need to fill some of these middle positions. Uh, I want to talk and leave you with three or four different sets of takeaways in the amount of time that I have, and I'll probably skim through a lot of these slides very, very quickly. But in terms of the marketplace today, I think there's no question that prices are at or above pre-recession levels. Uh, I wrote a paper in 2011 that basically said we would not be back to where we were right before the recession to around 2016, 2017. And frankly, at that point in time, I was really not sure that we would actually achieve those, those, those former pre-recession thresholds. It's remarkable that we have. And at the same time, even though these prices have come back, uh, mortgage rates remain at absolute historic lows. And uh, I think for those of you who have not maybe recently been in the housing market, I bought my first house in 1982 and I had a 14% mortgage. Uh, so at least that's one problem that we don't have to manage in the course of today's discussion. But I think it's also important as we explore what are really local regulatory issues and solutions that we actually function inside a national marketplace. And there's a lot of things that no matter how aggressive we are and how insightful or creative we are, we can't affect those variables. Uh, production is down. If I want to leave you with a single sentiment today is, is that vast quantities of housing supply resolve a lot of problems. And that's partially why, as we were recovering from the recession, 
housing inched up in cost very, very slowly and then suddenly exploded. We had excess inventory. Now, in fact, we have deficiencies in inventory. And what's very, very odd about the Orlando area, perhaps some of the other markets uh, that the uh, other people have spoke to, is, is that our inventory and its production is concentrated for the most part in among a handful of builders. Uh, when you turn your regional market over to a national set of producing entities, uh, we are, in fact, partially beholden on them to solve a lot of the problems we have. And uh, these handful of builder developers are responsible for actually delivering a significant amount of our inventory. And we have to think about what that really means for the product. And of course, with that inventory, all these prices that we've been discussing are going to remain high. And for the first time, not only is, is home ownership declining, is rental increase, the rates at which the increases are occurring in rents are historically disproportionate. And to the degree we even had any amount of excess inventory, that has been scarfed up in large measure by a number of investors. Uh, we actually had large national invent investors acquiring substantial blocks of homes that then went into the rental pool. And we've never experienced this at all before in the housing market in the United States. But the reason I've listed this at this last item is because this is an artifact of our history, our age group, uh, all the demographics that are assembled. And that's consumers, whatever their, their various economic or uh, sociological uh, profile, they have very, very strong expectations about what their housing requirements are. And we haven't really discussed much about that today. Um, what you see here is just the ebb and flow very, very quickly uh, that discusses housing prices. And you see, uh, punctuated by each of those bubbles, how they have risen and fallen in concert with the different recessionary pools that we've been through. Okay, so sometimes we can't really see things in this light. Uh, what we see over here is a history of homes that basically shows the median price going up, 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 and up. And what's interesting, this, this second graphic just really displays that last portion uh, of the home price relationship and how, again, even though we've had some minor blips in the last couple of years, it has been steadily going upward. But I talked about the decline in mortgage rates, and you see that they are literally a fraction of what they were uh, in, in, in 1982. In theory, obviously, this should free up many, many more financial resources to acquire housing. So what, what's actually occurring here? Uh, these are our housing starts. Uh, the top line is the, the normalized rate of production. So you can see that we're literally at a fraction of the of, of the inventory that we should be producing. And what we see towards the end of 2016 is I hope you can see, yes, you can. Okay, some of the colors are showing up. So what you can see at the end of 2016 is a minor, is a minor upturn, which now constitutes a nine-year high in inventory. And the gap you see between the inventory and the normalized production is really uh, what we should be producing in housing. So that is exacerbating the overhang uh, of demand relative to the supply that's being delivered. So the typical response would be is then why isn't the housing market actually delivering these units to take up that gap? Uh, the upward movement on this particular graph really addresses credit standards for banks. And uh, the top part coincides with the recession as you might expect it to be. It really shows that banks during the recessionary periods were absolutely uh, tightening credit standards as quickly as they could. We're now entering a period where actually the number of banks are beginning to loosen some of their credit uh, standards. So there is a glimmer of hope that in conjunction with expectations about the economy growing, expectations about more housing being demanded, that these decre decreasing credit concerns will actually enhance the supply of, of housing starts. But this is what that gap looks like. 
and it's pretty significant. You can see the history based on the bar graph. You can see an average normalized production, and you can see the rate of household formation. So finally, some of us are moving out of the basement of our parents' home. We're getting out of that back bedroom. If our grandparents are getting rid of the kids in our house, and they are forming uh, latently, they are forming their own housing uh, demand unit, but we still have a, an extraordinary gap that we need to fill. I talked very quickly about this production concentration. Um, these lines really represent how tightly con compacted the, the production is among a handful of developers. We have a, an unusually high number of producers that are responsible for closing units in the thousands of units a year. Homeownership rates are down. I think that's a redundant point. Uh, but this is the one that you haven't really heard before, is that in the terms of the rate of growth, rents now are finally exceeding housing prices in terms of their growth. And given the shortage of supply and the mix and concentration of what is or isn't being developed, I mean, frankly, that shouldn't be at all a surprise when we link those things together. But here, I think, is the takeaway, is that housing is getting bigger past the recession. It's driven largely by what we want as consumers and those people that we interact with and what they're expecting in terms of a housing product. So we've heard several times about the average size of a house, and we're not really going to be able to see what I was trying to show. But uh, un unlike my friends in planning, my emphasis here is really on numbers, not on pictures, so I'm going to have to bear, get you to bear patience with me. But the first line shows that in 1950, the average size home was 978 square feet, with an average per person reading more to the right of 272 square feet per person. I think you can just quickly go to the bottom. So in 2016, we're closing out an average home size of about 2640 with 1,000 square foot per person. So in essence, we are now building more square feet per person than we were building in an entire household in 1950. I mean, I think this is a startling piece of information. And these increasing demands for bedroom size and house size start to quickly erode any gains that we might be seeing uh, through either even marginal pricing or a significant reduction in mortgage rates. Um, what this also talks about is the high average price of a home relative to our earnings. Again, not that 1950 needs to be a bellwether, but we can easily read that behind me. Uh, our median household income was about uh, 3.64 in terms of its ratio to the price of a new home of $11,000, which you can't even buy, I guess, a new car for $11,000 anymore. <laughs> But as we go to 2016, we've, we've literally not only doubled the size of our house, uh, we've doubled the size of that price relative to income. We're now working at multiples of about 6.26. It takes a lot of intervention then to alter that calculus, right? Okay, so what about the housing industry itself? Um, with, with all respect to whatever it is we want, there's an extraordinary competition for capital. That's partially why you see the gap between production and where the capital is going. Uh, even today, real estate of any kind, whether it's commercial or residential, is among the riskiest of asset classes. And it requires a very high level of return in order to attract money to go into that. Um, we've talked a lot about density, which can, in fact, lower unit costs but however, as we increase density, we also actually have higher production costs. And there is a very, very fine point at which the intersection between production gains intersects with the increased density. So it's not just a matter of physical environment and appearance. It's a matter of adjusting and weighing those costs that are, uh, that are created as we go into more production and higher density housing. Uh, and despite all of this, the amazing thing is, is that the secondary data available to us is really saying that profits are down in the housing industry. So except for a handful of builders, it's very, very hard to continue attracting capital. Uh, we have very, very high expected returns in real estate. If we can't make them, the money's going to drift to another set of investments. 
Um, I put this graphic together because it is something we've been talking about, uh, and, and it, it very, very clearly, sh clearly shows at the very bottom of the columns, concept one, concept two, high density, medium density. Uh, there is a significant cost premium that's exacted in the construction cost per square foot as we go up higher. So what we're really talking about is, is, is the curve and the intersection. Um, this is a very, very quick snapshot from Duncan Associates, which does a national survey of uh, regulatory charges. One of the problems we face in Florida in particular as a higher cost regulated state is that our fees are totally non-discriminatory, meaning they don't discriminate between affordable housing and non-affordable housing. Uh, and so in the national numbers from 08 to 2015, you see that those numbers have been relatively stable. Uh, in some jurisdictions in Florida, they've actually diminished slightly, but they're well above the national sets of numbers. Uh, without belaboring this, all we're showing here is, is that even though concept one and concept two have very, very different construction costs, they have exactly the same fees if they're in fact the same size unit. So that's something that we need to have a dialogue about is how our fees actually affect what it is we want to do. Hypothetical project alternatives, density increases, construction price increases. Uh, in reality, it's not a downward curve. It's a U-shaped curve. And somewhere on that continuum of cost relative to land cost, we have this, 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 this crossover that suggests that next unit, that next square foot, is actually going to then diminish any pricing and cost advantages we have. So while we want to advocate for increased density, certainly for the appearances that need to be modified and, and controlled, we have to be sensitive to the fact that density by itself is not, absolutely is not a cure-all, and there are certain levels of intensity or density that actually, in the current regulations, may not maximize what that particular density is for a specific product. So uh, without belaboring what those densities are for a moment, we'll just satisfy ourselves with the discussion that um, it's just not that clear cut a relationship. The only thing I really wanted to call your attention to here is several years of uh, financials assembled by the National Association of Home Builders. Uh, obviously, not necessarily the most independent and unbiased source for this discussion, uh, but it does show what I think is is two factors that are are quite striking. The first is that the construction cost has very measurably increased for a particular type of unit and product representing today about 62% of the total price of the house. Correspondingly, a lot size or a lot cost has decreased somewhat to about 18 to 20%. But the startling part is with those changes that are being adjusted uh, to match the, 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 the things that we're imposing, profits nationally are down to about 9%. And that just barely is enough to attract capital into this business. And you may hear more about that from our associates uh, from the actual construction index. Final slide, and, and we'll put a wrap to it, is that if we believe, if we believe that housing is really growing that much, if we believe our use of that space is, is really not as effective or as efficient as it could be, we have a very simple case that consumers are over allocating resources to housing. And whether or not we agree with any of the currently national proposed tax policies, one thing that has been discussed is the role of the mortgage tax deduction. I know largely we're discussing today rental, not ownership property, but when we talk about uh, the mortgage tax deduction, we're talking about a federal tool that in effect is causing us to overcate over allocate our personal home ownership resources into, how, into housing so that we can take advantage of that tax structure. Uh, I don't want to emphasize, absolutely do not want to overemphasize how risky real estate remains even as we have this overhang for formations uh, relative to production 
And if it wasn't perceived to be that risky, we would clearly have more people entering in, into the production cycle. Uh, I want to dissuade you from believing that uh, on affordability, that density by itself is a, is a one-dimensional solution because it's a very, very complex, multivariate type of issue. I want to show you this, this one other slide, and then uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going, to, uh, going to hang it up, is if we stayed, um, uh, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I want to wrap up just by saying that these are what I believe should be our policies consideration. Uh, from my other panelists, you've, talk, talk, you've heard that we have to think about ways of filling that middle. And middle is not going to be filled only by focusing on home ownership. Um, that's largely a consumerist type of activity. I believe that fees, while they're, prob while they're appropriate, I mean, I don't think we can do a lot with our built environment without looking at fees. I also think that they're potentially problematic. And what the genesis of these fees are, uh, how we choose to calculate them, and Florida law is, is frankly, is very, very generous in terms of how we calculate these fees. There isn't a codification of how they need to be calculated. There's a codification of how they need to be applied. So I suggest there's some thinking that needs to occur there. Uh, production is down. Obviously, that's going to have an impact. I say we need to raise production. And as Susan was talking about, I don't really want to talk about affordable housing. I only want to talk about housing. It's not a, it's not a two-word conundrum. It should be a single-word conundrum, housing. Uh, capital as such, then, and housing supply are, in my opinion, the major issues. And so while programs that are directed exclusively at the kind of income and economic segments that I think are probably represented by this constituency, that by itself isn't, isn't really enough to raise the production. And if we deconstruct the problem and step back from it, then we really have three areas that we need to think about. And I think it is about as simple as these three areas. And there's, there's probably our forming task forces that will address with each of these in, in succession. Certain financial things that we can address uh, because some resources are local, some programs are local. Certainly we're in a position to, to deal with all the planning and regulatory issues that were laid out here today. And then there's some very, very interesting legal things which I don't really have time to discuss today, but I will just give you a quick example of what that would be is there is anybody in this room has bought a new car within the last two years know that you can step into a car dealership and buy, pick your choice of cars, a $25,000 car, let's say, and walk out of the dealership in about two hours. It's impossible for any of you in this room to go buy a $25,000 vacant lot and leave with that vacant lot in less than 30 days. I want you to ask yourself, what are some of the transactional costs associated with putting real property, whether it's home ownership or rental property, into some form of active use? I think these are discussions we need to have. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Owen. Next up, we're going to hear from Tony Del Poso with Related Urban Development on Making Affordable Housing Feasible. Tony is the Vice President of Finance for Related Urban, where he is responsible for obtaining, negotiating, and closing all financing transactions on all their projects. Mr. Del Poso has a finance degree and extensive experience and established relationships with the na largest national lenders around the country including the largest tax credit equity investors and syndications. Tony. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about concepts of how we can work together to try to make deals that might not be feasible, maybe taking advantage of what we have and are not utilizing. So um, 
Making affordable housing feasible really does need to be a collaborative effort between the local government and the developer. And, and from what I've seen today, it certainly looks like, uh, you know, the local government around here certainly um, has, has some great thoughts and, and is really on the right track how we can get that done. So uh, to touch upon some of the local government strategies that we've been able to utilize that have made uh, affordable housing feasible, let me uh, get into some of them. You know, land, a lot of local governments have access to land. It could be, you know, underutilized sites. It could be existing housing communities. And what we've been able to do is redevelop some of these underutilized lots and basically create new mixed-use environments that really are benefiting everyone and be able to serve a wide variety of income levels. So uh, by, by the local government offering flexibility with either ground lease payments or structuring it so that they're taking back paper on, on the purchase price of the land, what ends up happening is the capital necessary to come out of the ground to do development or to rehabilitate or whatever the case may be is substantially increased. We're able to compensate these uh, municipalities by being able, or, or agencies, by being able to offer them some participation in cash flow or other uh, mechanisms that are basically driven that do not reduce the amount of debt that we're able to put on the site and therefore uh, make capital that much more difficult to come by. So uh, to give you a couple of case examples, um, we have a project here in Miami uh, called uh, Liberty Square Rising. This is uh, basically nine square city blocks. It uh, is a public housing community with uh, over 700 public housing uh, units. This was built in the early, it, back in the 1930s. It's one of the oldest housing communities in the country. Um, we've uh, undertaken with a joint effort with the city of Miami, Miami-Dade County, a major redevelopment effort whereby we're introducing different income levels we're going to replace the public housing. We're still going to do 700 units plus of public housing. But in turn, we're also providing affordable housing, workforce housing, a ton of community service facilities, retail, and a bunch of other ancillary uses that, that are going to benefit the entire community. Um, we're working on a similar type of project with Tampa Housing Authority along the West River in Tampa. If you see this area here, on the lower portion, there's about 44 acres. In those 44 acres, they have about 800 public housing units. Again, like we're doing in Miami, we're reconfiguring the site. We're basically adding, adding mixed income components to it, retail, office, other ancillary uses that are going to benefit the whole entire community. But by, by mixing in income levels and by being able to access land inexpensively, what we're in essence doing is being able to serve these underserved communities, particularly workforce housing. A lot of some of, there was some mention earlier about 80% AMI. Those are really underserved uh, income levels, and we're really trying to capture that marketplace. So those were a couple of examples of, of big redevelopment efforts. It could be done on a much smaller scale. And uh, forgive me because I, you know, we do a lot of our development in the Miami area. This is some very dense housing, but it doesn't have to be. So if you look. Um, at this particular uh, picture, this is a, an overhead view of a project that consisted of 96 public housing units on the south side of the property there. If you look to the north, you see some cars parked a little bit towards the right there. That was their parking lot. What we were able to do is, in, 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 uh, in conjunction with Miami-Dade County Public uh, Housing and Community Development, is build all of the public housing on the portion of the site where the parking is located freeing up the bottom of the par parcel for future development. Like I said, this is in the Miami's urban core. This is extremely expensive land. This is probably 10, 20, 30 million dollar land. But in essence, we're able to take the residents, move them to the north portion of the site. This is the building that, that you saw the overhead of. And now we're going to be able to free it up for future development. Granted, this formula, doing high rises like this, isn't for every community, but what is for every community is being more efficient with the resources that they have available at their disposal. So one of the things, um, if, if, if municipalities and local governments are serious about serving these underserved communities, is making sure that when they have funding and they set awards for funding, that they, they really encourage having multiple income levels. 
And I think that's really important for a number of factors. Number one, it helps projects become feasible because with all affordable or all 80% median income levels, it becomes very, very challenging. But once you introduce some other income levels, number one, you're avoiding blight, you're mixing in you know, different segments of the population, and it's really helping us achieve our long-term goals. Then there should also be, I, I, we've been a proponents of this with Florida Housing for a long time, there should some, be some reward for developers that are able to really most efficiently utilize that subsidy. Make sure that they're taking that subsidy and building the most housing units as efficiently as possible. Green features. We all know their importance, sustainability, and things like that. Sometimes, you know, local governments or other agencies, they, they require lead and certifications like this. There's other ways of achieving that goal, you know, that may not be as, as costly because there's certain third-party administrative and other costs associated with getting designations. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. <clears throat> Incentives, and I think uh, a few of our uh, local government uh, representatives touched on this. Incentives are key, and it's, they're really key because there are a lot of incentives that are really driven towards the, 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 the affordable housing, but not very little towards workforce. So what we were able to do in Miami is we wrote a whole inter uh, attainable housing code. We worked with local politicians and basically built into the Miami 21, City of Miami zoning code, a bunch of incentives to encourage the development of workforce housing. It included density bonuses, I mean substantial density bonuses, parking requirement reductions, permit fees, impact fees, and then of course if there's CRAs involved, uh, tax incremental financing is, is, is extremely important as well. So it really is uh, in, incumbent upon all of us to really make sure if, if you're serious about having different income levels and serving underserved markets in your community, that we're really being creative and thinking out of the box about ways that we can um, you know, encourage developers to do development in our communities. So, like I said, it's a collaborative effort. I'm not only asking the municipalities and local government to do their job, we have to do our job too as developers. So, this may not be so applicable here, but as, uh, you know, was touched upon, once you get over certain height levels, there's certain uh, additional costs that go into your buildings. So, we obviously have to always be cognizant of it and be most efficient when we develop. Um, you know, surface parking, you know, the need to be um, close to transit and things like that is a huge consideration. It cannot be overlooked because parking adds tremendously to projects. You know, when we start talking about parking structures, we're talking about urban infill type projects. Urban infill is great because it's close to everyone's jobs typically, but we need to be cognizant of the fact that you can't build over parking and expect your project to be inexpensive and feasible. And, and, you know, detached structures work a little bit better, surface parking, but to reduce those parking counts is a really a key consideration. So uh, one of the things that, that we've been working on is coming up with micro units that make sense. Uh, we've we spent countless hours. George Perez, who's chairman of the related group, he has spent countless hours trying to figure out the best way to provide micro units that really make sense. So, this is one that we came up with here. It's 414 square feet. It's a studio. But if you look at this unit, it is spacious. And you look at, it has a full-size kitchen. It has a couch and living area here. And then if you look over there, the bed is off to the right, looking out that way. I mean, there are ways that we can, in the development community, build efficiently that are going to drive our costs down, be able to serve these underserved markets, and, and, and basically everybody is a win-win for everyone. Uh, this is an example of a 2-1 that is extremely spacious. This is 742 square feet. Um, but we also have a 645 urban um, square foot project that we, I'd be happy to show, share with all of you. Um, some of the things that we could do to keep costs down as developers and some of the things that maybe the local government could be thinking about is, you know, a lot of times in some of these... Um, funding uh, proposals, we're being asked to provide ceramic tile, we're asked to provide 30-year roofs. There's so many great products that are out there right now. Particularly, there's vinyl flooring products that look like wood. They last a tremendously long time. They're much easier to install. They are quicker, quicker, less expensive, last a long time, 
and really are a great alternative. They're even warmer for the, for the resident on the, on the touch. So those are one of the things that we want to incorporate into our projects. We've gotten Miami-Dade County to get away from some of these tile requirements and things like that. Obviously, this is in the living area. It doesn't really apply to bathrooms. Um, and then 30-year roofs. I mean, that's been a requirement in, in many areas that we provide the 30-year roof. The 20-year roof is substantially less expensive, still great. These are products that we are using in our market rate developments. There's no reason. I think that the affordable housing development community should be held to a higher standard. If our goal is to provide housing efficiently, then our goal should need to be to make it as inexpensive as possible. Uh, thank you for your time. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Okay. We have finally made it to the uh, home plate and the home stretch and our last speaker is Gary Gray and he's going to talk to us about um, some uh, mixed use development that they are working on uh, in Osceola County right now. Gary Gray is an architect and a developer. He is a principal with OLC plus DW Architects where he heads the Orlando offices with offices in Orlando, Denver, Columbus, Cairo, Tokyo, the firm focuses on healthcare and education related projects with a special focus on designing healthy communities. Gary? Uh, oh, and I have a stopwatch, uh, not a watch watch. Thank you. Um, I feel really privileged to be the home base. Uh, you're all so relieved, uh, and you're so looking forward to when I say thank you. Uh, so, as we were waiting here, um, Tohoga Development Group is here in Central Florida. We're working on a project in Osceola County. Uh, I'll show you where it is in a second. But we are master developers. We don't do the vertical part. We buy the land. Um, and... Yeah, I'm pushing the wrong button. Go ahead. Uh, we buy the land, we entitle the land, and then we do another step I think that's a little different in that, yes, thank you. Um, and to encourage the market rate developers out there to see a vision, we take it up one step further and we go through schematic design on the proposed product that we have on the site. Uh, we go through schematic architecture. I'm selfish about that. I like to do that. But we also add the economic uh, information and performance to that schematic design, and we add market rate inf or marketing information to that schematic design. Mm -hmm. So that we go to the marketplace with what we call concept packages that are easily reviewable and easily de determinable on whether this is a go or a no-go for a prospective tenant. We are very intentional about how we develop our projects, and I'll go through what our criteria are in just a second. Quickly, where we are, uh, Osceola County, Susan showed this map before. Um, we are one of those massive master plan communities around Lake Toho. Um, I'm focusing on what I'm calling the town center project. This is my part of the development. Uh, along Neptune Road, um, we have a Neptune Middle School, for those of you that are familiar with the area. We have for phase one is 35 acres. Um, it's, it's part of a 750 acre uh, master plan community. We're entitled for 2,300 residential units, 1,000 of those being apartments. Uh, within the town center area, we can have about 300,000 square feet of retail commercial. Uh, and so we're going to hit those numbers. Uh, now, in, in phase one, which is what you're looking at here, I want to run through the product because it's a mixed-use product that most town centers, when you see the orange things on your land plans, whatever that town center is, it's kind of a hope and a dream that someone will come in and put in some really nice uh, restaurants and some really nice office buildings and some really nice this and some really nice that. We're trying to be very intentional about how we do that. So building A, which is up at the entry point of Neptune Road, is scheduled to be a health facility service facility. So we're proposing an integrated health and wellness facility there that's about 35,000 square feet of fitness and about 100,000 square feet of medical office space. Um, we have done projects like this around the country, and this is kind of the model that's evolving for health systems as they deploy their, their services into the communities, this is becoming the model that they're most responsive to. So we're targeting a health system to come to the corner of Neptune Road and Tohoqua Boulevard. Across the street at B is a food hall. 
we discovered that this site is in a food desert, strangely enough, um, even though there's a Publix about a mile away. Uh, so as we developed the apartments, we felt like we needed to have some kind of food offered on the site to make this possible. So we're modeling this after sort of a hybrid of Crooked Can and East End Market, uh, where there's, there's food and entertainment, but there's also grocery, locally grown and curated food and grocery on the site that's accessible to the people, but we also want it to be sort of a town center and community building for the, for the residents. Building C are mixed-use office buildings. We have some, some tenants that are coming in from uh, academia. They're looking for uh, incubator space. We have some tenants that are coming in from local businesses in Osceola County. We're trying to keep our rents down to the $18 a square foot triple net rate so that it's uh, affordable for these people to come into this space. Um, and then C or D, our uh, apartments, and this is where we have first floor retail, second and third floor apartments. This is a mixture of micro units that are about 315 square feet, basically a hotel room. Uh, we have 450 studios, 450 to 500 square foot studio apartments. And then we have a mixture of ones and twos after that, nothing else, no threes, just flats that are in the small range. Our goal there is to respond to the, the uh, empty, or the entry level employees at Florida Hospital up the road, at Neo City up the road, at other kinds of employers that are within the area. So we know after having visited these businesses that their employees cannot find a place that's affordable to live near where they work. So that's our target market. It happens to be millennials. So we kind of want to have this walkability aspect to it too and the lifestyle aspect so that they're, they're able to live and work in a, in a place where they can uh, see their friends so that they can go over to the food hall and they can go to the recreation center across the street. It's all walkable. It's also within a, a district that, that, that the county is working with us on and making this part of the transit uh, line so that the uh, Kissimmee Hospital people can get to and from work, uh, the Neo City people can get to and from work. So that we're trying to reduce the number of cars that are being parked here. Again, with ones and two bedrooms, we're going to have uh, fewer cars. So it's all surface parking. It's Transact 3 and 4 right now. But we have left space that if this is really wildly successful, we can put in structured parking as these changes, as these things change over time. We're also trying to bring that, that street level retail, we're trying to push all of the retail down to the bottom road down there, which is a major connector east-west. So that, and we're turning it perpendicular to the street so that there's some texture for people to feel like it's, it's not just a wall of, of building, that there's green texture that they can get back and forth and to and from, and that there's two-sided uh, buildings here so that they're not just a front and a back. Everybody has a courtyard on either side of their building. Uh, on, the, on the upper left, I can see it better on the screen maybe, uh, E uh, is a library. Where's the county librarian? She doesn't know that. They don't know this. <laughs> We're working with the, uh, the K building down at the bottom is a K through 12 charter school. 2,800 students that are coming in there that's in contract. Um, they're going to bring their students in, and they've agreed with us to move their library out of their building to make it accessible to the public. And so we're mixing in mix, uh, maker space with that library so that the students and, and the kids from the neighborhood can come in after school and learn 3D printing. They can learn coding. They can learn all kinds of activities. But it's part of the, of the charter school, but they're building it outside their building so it's accessible to the public and usable by the public. We thought that was a wonderful thing for them to do. So we said, well, why don't we provide some food for you out of our food hall for your cafeteria within your school? And I didn't know this, but if you're a student in their, in their program and they wear a, a little pendant that has a, a, a geosynchronous code inside their pendant, they can go off campus for a certain period of time, then they get zapped. I, I don't know what happens. But, <laughs> um, so for kids that are in 11th and 12th grade, we're programming that they can come certain days of the week up to the food hall and have lunch. We're trying to communicate, we're trying to integrate this activity to get people moving back and forth to get the integration within the community. So we're also hoping that our, that our health care partner will be committed to that food and that dietary regimen and also work with us in terms of where the food hall is. And then even within the fitness facility, which has its own facility, will provide healthy food for the students and for the community. So we're really after reducing food costs, improving the quality of the food, and increasing the integration that goes on within this community. Uh, we have some of these products that you've all talked about. I won't go through them all, but we have cottage homes. We have 750 to 850 square foot one bedroom houses. Uh, we have higher density twins, quads, and 
sixplex buildings that are going in here that have densities up to 40 units to the acre. But I, I want to move on to one of the biggest things that we're trying to um, work on. It's number one is sustainability. And we have identified and we've taken the walkability score and kind of changed this a little bit in terms of the components here. But we think that there's 12 pieces that we want to intentionally try to embed in every one of our communities as we do these. Health services, food, entertainment, parks and recreation, market rate rental housing, K through 12, education, the full continuum of housing, including single family, office, which means employment, higher education, a public library, a fitness facility, and retail. If you look at the walkability score, which you're probably all familiar with, that really helps the sustainability. It raises property values, and it creates a, a lot of velocity in real estate development. If, we are if we're successful in intentionally embedding these 12 components in our community, we think that that's going to help make it sustainable over time. It will be able to react to the market. We think it's going to bring velocity for the sales, which is going to help our, our buyers. And we think it's going to create a more uh, integrated social network so that people are going to want to live there for a longer period of time. I keep going on the wrong button. I'm going to skip over these because I want to, I, I think the one part of this that I can uh, talk about, everybody's done a wonderful job of saying everything I was going to say. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> there is one part I think that I can touch on that, that hasn't been uh, discussed. How do you get the private market developer to do this stuff? What are the conversations that go on in the back rooms and in the conference rooms that, that you probably never get to sit in on? <laughs> How do you do that? We are trying to take on, in, in this project at Tehoqua, to be a test bed. They need to see that this works. They don't want to take our word for it. They need comps. They have to go out and finance this stuff. They have to convince their investors. They have to convince their partners. So at Tehoqua, we're trying to create small templates that are going to demonstrate all of the things that have been discussed here. We're trying to, to find places within this town center, which now we're going to expand to 60 acres, to be able to create the product and the template and help them make that successful. And I just want to use this one little example here. So this is a small single family house uh, for three people, or for a family of three, uh, 1,663 square feet. Most home builders, and, and, and Owen talked about uh, large volume production home builders, they build the same product out there because the lots are all the same. 40, 50, 60 foot by 110, 120 foot lots. That's all they get. That's, that's what they build their houses on. We have to be able to find a way to get them a different geometry so that the house that fits on that lot meets a different market. So one of the things that we're proposing, we're doing this for one, a national home builder, is a smaller house that's a tandem car garage, one car garage with one space uh, in the driveway, uh, wide open first floor space. Again, millennials and young families are looking for flexibility on how they live. No dining rooms, no kitchen. They want flexibility. They want outdoor space. So this house will fit on a 60-foot lot, but all of the side yard is to the left of the picture, not to the back where nobody uses it and not to the front where you have to keep your grass cut every week or somebody will yell at you. We're trying to create an indoor-outdoor space so that they can have gardens, so that they can go out there and have physical activity and improve their health, so that they can meet their neighbors. We want to use that outdoor space in a much more meaningful way. So the first floor is wide open with a kitchen in the back. The second floor, one thing that we're doing in a lot of our proposed house designs to these guys, to the home builders, is I call them bunkies or bunk rooms. I don't know about you all, when I was in college, I lived in a bunk bed, and I'm not a small person. Um, it worked, it was fine. Why do you need a big room with a bed in it? Let's do a bunk bed with a, with a closet and a desk below it, and that's the privacy space and reallocate that space for more activity zones or for children to separate themselves from their parents. So any of you have kids that you want to get them out of your way, send them up there. But it's a, it's a new way of thinking for these home builders. They've never thought about this stuff before because the way they go about looking at what they're going to do, they go out and they shop the neighborhood and they find out that the guy over there has got a kitchen cabinet that's five square feet bigger and the walk-in closets three square feet bigger, and they come back to the architect and say, get me a house that's like this. We need to reinvent the way they think this process, and we need to reinvent the product that we're giving them to put their houses on. And I think that everything that we've been talking about today leads to that opportunity, but we have to show them that it works. We have to show them that they can make money at it. So at Tahoqua, I have the wonderful privilege of having partners that we have no debt on the land, and they're letting me play with this 
to, to use this as a test bed. And so we want to be able to, to hear the input that you all are giving us because we want to try to figure out, is there something you want to do? Let's see if we can do it. It's a wonderful opportunity for us at Tohoku, and we're very thankful that we're working with Susan to, to make that happen. And that's all I've got. I'm less than 20 minutes. How about that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Um, before we get to Q&A, I just wanted to um, thank our panelists for the wonderful presentations they had, the wealth of information they gave us today, and really demonstrating the um, complexity of the issue that um, faces us and the path and the framework that we can use to try to um, solve these problems. So I would, again, want to thank our panelists. We do have one remaining workshop in this series, and everybody here today uh, uh, will get an invitation uh, to that workshop when it gets um, scheduled. Um, in terms of uh, um, after the Q&A, uh, we, we ask you to um, look at some of the uh, products and uh, displays that the developers have. We also have, a, a, there is a tiny home from Cornerstone outside the building to the left. Um, and I just wanted, they wanted me to mention that this tiny home is a, um, a representation of, of what a tiny home could be. Um, but this is not their main product that they are currently working on. They have a uh, code compliant um, tiny home that they are, uh, that would be put on a concrete slab that they um, will be able to talk to you, to you about. But make sure you check it out on your way out. I, I, I will tell you, um, they don't call it tiny homes for uh, any other reason than it is tiny. We've been sitting up here all morning. Come on. Yes. Hang on. And please announce your, your name uh, for the record before you ask the question. Okay, good morning, everyone. Some help's on the way. Check, check. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Susan? Well, I can tell you, I don't know, is this working? Can you hear me? Uh, what we've done in Osceola County, we've done a number of things, and one of them is that area that you've looked at with the mixed use district. It's a very well connected road network, it's higher density and intensity, and it's a mix of uses. But even in our suburban areas, we have built connectivity requirements into our code because we need everything to be connected. And if we can't um, if there is no connectivity, you talked about actually will have much higher density, a much 
when we talk about multimodal is pedestrian, bicycle, vehicular, and circulators in every uh, potential technology. So we want to be able to be specific, but at the same time realistic about how incrementally we can get to uh, the freedom uh, and, and from the automobile and uh, having a, a additional options as well so that we move away from dependency. The more walkable the urban environment is, and that takes, again, the formula of good urban design, you know, we move away from having oversized blocks with blank walls, which even though you may be close to a station area or a specific station, it doesn't uh, allow you to walk because it deters you from walking. It's all about that human scale as well. So, I would agree with Alberto. It's about creating the walkable urbanism. Um, and monorails aren't exactly the most efficient way of using transit resources per in particular. But I think in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see a massive disruption of the transportation industry as we go into um, um, automated vehicles and those types of technologies, which are just going to have more impacts for urban form. It makes it more imperative that we as planners and cities really think about creating more of that walkable urbanism because every trip begins with your feet somehow. And that's where people actually want to live. Thank you, Jason. Question over here. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is David Marks. I'm I have a company named Marketplace Advisors. I've been working in the mainly in the retail industry for the last since um, I guess since the the uh, uh, about '91. Um, and used to work with uh, Owen Beitch's company um, back in the late 80s um, and do some consulting with some municipalities and so forth. But I've been heavily involved with the development side. And recently, I guess I've kind of had a uh, second coming. I've been becoming very much concerned about the environment. And uh, I, I feel a little bit like an outlier here because it seems like we're, sounds like we're very pro-development, almost too pro-development. You know, one of the concerns I have is we are, the, the, from a sustainable perspective, um, we're, we're, going to, we're going to develop out Florida until there's no lots left, it seems like. That's the, the attitude that we have. And I know that, that kind of fights the idea of sustainability. But, you know, one of the things, you know, I, I like the, the last project where we talked about the town center and, and community. Uh, I'm very concerned about the lack of community. I think, we, you know, we have so many social problems today, social problems, environmental problems. And um, we really shouldn't be allowing developers to come along, just take a piece of land and put on 20 houses out in the middle of nowhere. And that's the kind of development pattern that we've seen because we haven't had the leadership from the municipalities, from the cities. You know, if you're going to have a house, you should have, it should be walkable. You know, th this is the way communities used to be built. You know, if you look at the way Winter Park was built or, or Orlando, the original community, um, you look at what, what the way um, ball, um, uh, Lake Nona is being developed today. Um, maybe that's not as inclusive as I would like to see it being developed. But I've got a real, you know, at the same time we're trying to create this, this stuff and make it more affordable, we're, we're making stuff that's very unsustainable, um, that, that's really not good planning. Um, so I don't know if that's a, how anybody wants to address that. That's a mouthful. Mr. Larkin. I, I would just say there's just this, there's different opportunities in the region for different cities to grow differently than they have in the past, and I think Orlando's starting to get there. In fact, in our city, we've had more um, population growth. In fact, the region has had more population growth within the city of Orlando as a central city than all the other suburbs combined, which starts to tell you, over the last five years, it starts to tell you that there's been a change in the market and there's ways that we can accommodate that better and actually have our city grow up, you know, and um, get that urban lifestyle that attracts jobs and people that want to live in our community um, and not just <coughs> relocate here. So you have to provide that, that demand, that, that walkable urbanism. There's a whole other side of this planning for infrastructure planning that we didn't get into, taxing districts and other things that I've been involved with in Orlando that actually is starting to transform some of our infrastructure so we have better streetscapes, more trees, and all the green kind of stuff that I think you're mentioning as well. In, in Osceola County, we've been doing a lot over the past 10 to 12 years. We've actually adopted an urban growth boundary uh, to, to contain that development. We've adopted the mixed-use districts. 
And we're going back now to look at our more suburban areas and retrofit them for more of that community-based development that you're talking about. One of the things that's interesting to me is an area like downtown Orlando developed incrementally over time and there were a lot of developers involved in that, which means the risk was um, dispersed. dispersed. And when you look at these large developments, and especially uh, Gary's point, that people need to see that this will work because they're taking on a lot of risk as a single developer to try to emulate the kind of development that we've seen grow incrementally. So for us, we're very interested in understanding what those risks are and in working with those developers to help that be successful. We want very much for those mixed-use areas to grow, and we need to play our part to help that development community understand how to put in that different product. Mayor Jacobs wants to say. Actually, I wanted to respond. I didn't catch your name, but I wanted to respond because you, you touched on two things that um, to me are extremely important and I don't want anybody to walk away from um, this initiative and this effort to create more housing that's affordable for our workforce to think that that means we're going to do that at the expense of the environment. So, so nothing that I've seen here and nothing that we've been talking about is about relaxing our environmental protection standards. And additionally, I think what is really exciting to me is the social connections, the social, I think somebody used the term social network. When I moved here from Atlanta 25 years ago, that was one of the things that I was struck by within about two years. I thought, this is different than any place I've lived, Miami, um, Atlanta, that there's so many more social connections. And I, I know if you've lived here your whole life, you, you probably don't notice it. But I noticed it immediately. And it's something that's really, it's, it's one of those intangibles that you want to hang on to. The idea of doing the mixed use type of development we're talking about, the idea that people that are needing to live in an affordable um, dwelling unit don't need to be segregated to some separate area of town and some separate development is really, I think, transformative in terms of integrating our, our community. We're a really cool place to live um, because we have so much diversity. And because we know each other and, and work together and our kids go to school with people that don't look like them or didn't come from the same background or have different religious beliefs or different personal beliefs. And because our kids are growing up that way, all of these, these things that have divided us for literally since the beginning of civilization are becoming invisible, <coughs> literally in a generation. It's just remarkable. And having housing that allows people to live next door to people who may not make as much as you gives those of us who have more wealth the ability to understand that at the end of the day, we're still all people. Whether we make more or we make less, we have the same desires, we have the same passion for our families, and it also gives those children the opportunity to aspire to be anything. And I think for me, it's just a rich, stimulating opportunity for this next generation. So the very issues you raise, I think if we do this right, if we do this right, we are definitely protecting the environment because we are not sustainable without an environment. I think as human beings, we sometimes think that like we're separate from the environment. We've gotten so comfortable with our air conditioning and our cars and everything that we sometimes forget that we are entirely dependent mm -hmm. upon the environment and that without sustaining the environment, we are not sustainable. But we also, if we can sustain what we have in this community that is developing this rich sense of, of unity and understanding compassion for each other in spite of our dif differences, and I think that's enriched by housing that also allows people to interact, not just at school, not just at the grocery store, but literally where they live. And I just, I'm very excited about it. I hope that all your fears, that we address them and we overcome them because that's probably as important as all of these other things that we talk about is the intangible component of community. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, that's my positive um, spin <laughs> on what I think we're doing. And that's what we're trying to do. And if we try and we understand what our goal is, we, we can get there. We get, you guys have been great, by the way. Every single one of you, very impressed. Thank you, Mayor. So we're going to um, entertain questions. Um, at, the panelists are going to be here, so anybody that has additional questions, feel free to come up and talk to us. 
Uh, again, the displays are out there. The tiny home is outside. Thank you all for coming today, and uh, we really appreciate you staying through this. Bye. Thank you.